Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the annual HICPICS public meetings. Today's meeting agenda will feature uh, biologicals, uh, particularly skin products. Okay, so my name is Felicia Eggleston. Many of you I'm familiar with as being the HICPICS coordinator at one time. I'm now part of the Part B drug team here in the hospital ambulatory group. So just some housekeeping items. The restrooms are straight down the hall to your left hand side. If you continue out to the lobby and make a right at the elevators and continue to go straight down the stairs, then you'll be at our lobby towards the coffee cafe and the cafeteria. Okay, we have been asked to remind you that for security purposes, visitors may not enter any areas other than the public areas, which is the lobby and the law lobby and the cafeteria without an escort. CMS is a non-smoking campus. There is a smoking area outside of the building near both of the guard entrances. We would like to ask that you would please place all Blackberries and cell phones on silent at this time. We would also like to ask that all speakers and anyone answering questions, please be sure to step up to the microphone so that we can hear all of you. This includes outside participants as well as agency participants. We would like to also ask that you would adhere to your speaking time. Primary speakers having up to 15 minutes and five minute speakers having five minutes. So I have my cell phone, it has a stop clock on it. I'll be keeping your time on my cell phone. As the time gets close, I have something back here. I'm just gonna jingle, you'll hear a little noise that lets you know that your time is near. And I will do that two minutes prior to your time being up for all 15 minute speakers. For five minute speakers, I'll just approach the podium when your five minute limit is, is nearing. Okay, so um, I will also like to tell you all that only I can call speakers, so just be mindful of that, not to call up any speakers. You cannot designate any of unused time to other speakers. And I want to share to you, before we get started, what's new this year. So what's new this year is our um, live streaming. This meeting is being webcast via CMS. The CMS webcast is live, so it begins when our meeting begins, which it has already begun. By your attendance here, you are giving your consent to the use and distribution of your name, likeliness, and voice during this meeting. You are also giving consent to the use and distribution of any personally identifiable information that you or others may disclose during today's meeting. Please do not disclose personal health information. The webcast can be found in archives after the meeting on YouTube and on the CMS Ustream website, and I believe it is there permanently. At appropriate times, I will call a coffee break and or lunch break today based on how our meeting progresses. And uh, at this time, I would like to call up and introduce Cindy Hake. She's the Deputy Director of CM's Division of Demi Post Policy and of the CMS National Level 2 HICPICS program. She will provide opening remarks and a brief description, background, and purpose of today's meeting. Cindy Hake, you guys. So aren't you all excited to see Felicia back? I know I am, and I loved watching her on the screen on live stream. So she is just as beautiful on the outside as she is on the inside. You really do look good on that screen, Felicia. You know, if you ever get tired of us, maybe you can have a career in film somewhere. And who ever thought we'd have a whole day of meetings on skin substitutes? <laughs> in fact, so, so yeah, we'll be hearing a lot about that today. But thank you, Felicia, and, and hello and welcome, everybody, to CMS's annual HICPICS public meeting. This is the first of our series for this year. Today is uh, day one of a two-day meeting for drugs, uh, biologics, and radiopharmaceuticals. And we typically have with us at these meetings members of, well, we always have members of CMS's HICPICS war group representing all government and non-government uh, health insurance sectors. We also have representatives of manufacturers and suppliers of some of the items on today's agenda. We get government relations, regulatory and compliance specialist personnel um, from provider organizations, industry consultants, clinical specialists, and every once in a while we get a member of the press in here with us. This public forum for 
discussion of HCPCS code applications arose out of the Benefits Improvement and Performance Act of 2000 ruling that originally pertained only to durable medical equipment. As many of you will remember, we quickly expanded the forum because we thought it was very worthwhile, uh, along with making a series of other improvements as part of a broader plan for a more transparent and open uh, HCPCS coding process to enhance our coding program and also to be responsive to the needs of a variety of stakeholders. As many of you know, Level 2 HCPCS is only one, of only, uh, one of six standard national code sets adopted under HIPAA for use in electronic claims processing. But in instituting a public component for coding considerations, and particularly in offering uh, the, a reconsideration opportunity, this reconsideration opportunity within the original coding cycle, CMS kind of took the lead in terms of um, opening up its processes um, and, and making them more transparent. And um, moving forward, we want to continue to be progressive. We are always looking for ways to make our processes more efficient and effective um, internally and, and, and also in terms of how we deal with our customers. We welcome ideas for enhancements to our coding procedures. As some of you are painfully aware, you know, this is the federal government. Our wheels are big and they turn slowly, but we do um, work towards improving our processes. Um, why not? It only makes sense to have the best process you can and one that serves uh, the needs of all our, all our stakeholders. So based on some feedback that we've received over the past year, year and a half, we've developed plans to implement several new mechanisms of adding transparency to the level two HCPCS coding process, which I'm happy to announce today. Actually, one of them Felicia uh, uh, announced, the first and, and the simplest really was um, was the live stream, uh, live streaming, which we, is effective for this year's public meetings. Secondly, we are pleased to announce uh, our plan to initiate a demonstration of a web-based notice and comment mechanism for allowing public input on certain internal HCPCS code requests. We're starting out with a limited demonstration that'll apply to internal requests to discontinue level two HCPCS codes only those that are not subject to some other mechanism of notice and comment, you know, like, like rulemaking, for example, and those that are not replaced by other or new codes because that's not uh, effectively discontinued. There would be a replacement. So via this demonstration, we're going to be providing advanced notice regarding internal decisions to discontinue codes, as I have described, and an opportunity for public input into these decisions. The demonstration is going to provide a valuable opportunity not only for us to hear public input uh, on these internal decisions, but also for us to um, gather critical data related to the logistics and the time and resources that are going to be involved in having a public component to internal requests. Um, <clears throat> obviously, uh, uh, this, is, this is going to be, there's going to be some resource intensity to this so, so that we can find an appropriate balance between the need for transparency and stakeholder input and our need to be nimble in making coding changes that improve program administration to the extent practical. Um, keep in mind, of course, CMS has to reserve the right to make immediate changes without notice and take comments later um, when situations arise that cause us to have to do so. So the first year of our demonstration is this year. And um, if we have any internal requests to discontinue codes that would fit the criteria I've described to you, we're gonna try to um, have those summaries published by July 1st. This is our first year, so uh, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll make it in that time frame. We'd like to allow a three week comment period and we're gonna have a centralized mailbox that'll be specified. Um, by which we will um, gather these comments. So please don't send all your comments directly to my email. <laughs> Thinking you'll get faster action, actually, uh, you know, it's, it's a struggle for me to keep my, my list of emails below 1,700. You don't get faster action. Uh, uh, if anything, it could be the opposite. So you would really want to use the specified um, centralized uh, mailbox to submit your comments where they'll be handled from there. <clears throat> We're going to review uh, the, uh, the comments to the internal request as we re-review the internal uh, 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 request itself. Um, and and the, the decisions will be folded into the outgoing HCPCS annual update. 
Now, additional details about this demonstration are available on our website. This was only published yesterday. We were trying hard to get something published before the first public meeting. So some of you may not have seen it yet. The details on there are basically as I have just des described, it, 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 uh, and it's on our um, face page. Uh, under uh, general information uh, and what's new. We'll also be folding information into our procedures document, but, but for now there's at least an outline of what we're planning on there. The third new <clears throat> mechanism for promoting transparency is that we are in the process of developing a mechanism by which we will share information pertaining to final decisions and rationale for individual HCPCS code applications. Um, in the past, the final decision letters have only gone to the applicants. There wasn't a sharing of that information other than, you know, whether codes appeared or did not appear in the annual update. Um, so we haven't quite worked out what that's going to look like yet, but um, we would like to uh, be able to implement that with the release of the final decisions this year. So uh, now back to the overview and, and process, uh, 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 overview of the HCPCS coding process as it relates to this public meeting and our expectations for today's meeting. This is mostly for those of you who are, are, are new to this meeting. Many of you have heard this uh, before. But uh, the public meet, before the public meeting, CMS's HCPCS work group reviews each and every application before us and we formulate a preliminary decision. Those decisions are on our website and they're in your uh, meeting agendas. The work group includes members who provide input based on their perspective of the national program operating needs of Medicare, Medicaid, the private insurance sector, and the Veterans Administration healthcare system. CMS publishes its preliminary decisions along with our decision-making rationale in advance of the meeting, as you know, and then via this public process, we invite applicants and others to provide testimony that either supports or refutes our preliminary decision, and as such, this public meeting provides a reconsideration opportunity within the same coding cycle. Final decisions are not made at this meeting. After the public meetings, the HCPCS workgroup reconvenes and we re-review uh, re all of the applications together with the input you've provided to us and, uh, and, re uh, the, and reconsider the preliminary coding recommendations and CMS staff also reconsider Medicare pricing recommendations that you see in the agendas. Sometimes decisions are changed based on input at these public meetings, which confirms the value and the importance of the meetings as part of the overall process. So for those of you providing comments to us today, if you've not done so already, would you please be sure before the end of the day to provide your comments, your, your top two or three speaking points to Jennifer Carver. Um, we use that information both in the work group's review to make sure that we've captured the points that are most important to you, and we also use that information as we public su publish summaries of the public meetings. These public meeting summaries will be published uh, in August on our website. They look very much like the agenda you have before you. They have a, a summary of the, of the um, topic under discussion. They have our preliminary decision, and then they will also have um, a couple of uh, uh, points that, that were made by the primary speakers. Final decision letters and the HCPCS annual update will be released by mid-November. We generally can't pin it down to any kind of a finer time point than that, which is the best we can do is to say, you know, no later than mid-November, um, although we didn't even make that last year, but you all know why. Uh, and in addition this year, in addition to the decision letters and the annual update, as I mentioned, we're going to have some kind of a mechanism to be sharing um, the, our, our final decisions and rationale for them. Most of the changes made to the code set become effective January 1 of the following year. So let me conclude by thanking you all for taking the time out of your busy schedules to be here with us today, especially those of you who've had to incur uh, expense to, to travel here, um, and to be here with us today. We're very glad that you're here. Our overall meeting experience is richer and the coding consideration is always more fleshed out because of the diverse perspectives shared with us at these public meetings. This forum was designed almost 13 years ago to capture, can you believe that? To capture stakeholder input and, and, uh, and experience. And your input really does matter to us. So we now have enough experience with this process to know that in fact, it makes a difference in terms of decision outcome. 
As I mentioned, sometimes decisions are in fact reversed or changed based on input provided to us via this forum. So based on that, we think that it um, uh, must also matter to you that we have an opportunity to share our preliminary decisions in this forum for you to provide comments. And in that vein, we look forward to your full participation today and all the good information that we're going to be uh, hearing based on your informed input. Thank you. Next, I would like to introduce Anne Halswell. She is the Director of the Division of Ambulatory Services and CM's Hospital and Ambulatory Policy Group. She will provide an overview of Medicare's Part B drug payment. A more detailed description of payment for Part B drugs is attached to your agenda. Come on, Anne. Thank you, Felicia, and good morning to everyone. So I'm going to talk a little bit about par payment for Part B drugs, biologicals, and radiopharmaceuticals. Medicare Part B currently covers a limited number of prescription drugs, and for the purpose of this discussion, drugs are going to be drugs and biologicals. So currently covered Medicare Part B drugs fall into three categories. The first one is drugs furnished incident to a physician's service. These are injectable or intravenous drugs as well as non-injectable or non-intravenous drugs that are administered incident to a physician's service. And under the incident to provision, the physician, the physician must incur a cost for the drug and must also bill for it. Incident to coverage is limited to drugs that are not usually self-administered. The second category is drugs administered via a covered item of DME, or durable medical equipment. So these are DME drugs that are administered through a covered item of DME, such as a nebulizer or a pump. And the third category is drugs covered by statute. These are drugs specifically covered by the statute, which include immunosuppressive drugs, hemophilia, blood clotting factor, certain oral anti-cancer drugs, oral anti-emetic drugs, pneumococcal, influenza, and hepatitis B vaccines, antigens, EPO for trained home dialysis patients, and certain other drugs that are separately billed by end-stage renal disease facilities and osteoporosis drugs. So drugs paid on a cost or prospective payment basis that are outside the scope of the current drug payment methodology include drugs furnished during an inpatient hospital stay except clotting factor, drugs paid under the outpatient prospective payment system, drugs furnished by ESRD facilities whose payments are included in the Medicare composite rate, and drugs furnished by critical access hospitals, skilled nursing facilities, unless they're outside of a covered stay, comprehensive outpatient rehabilitation facilities, rural health facilities, and federally qualified health centers. Prior to January 1, 2004, payment for the majority of Medicare Part B drugs was set at 95% of the average wholesale price. The statutory term AWP was not defined in law or regulation. So in creating payment limits for Medicare covered drugs, Medicare relied on the AWP, which referred to the AWP published in com commercial drug compendia, such as Red Book, Price Alert, and Metaspan. In 2004, the Medicare Prescription Drug Improvement and Modernization Act of 2003, which was the MMA, revised the drug payment methodology, reducing the payment rate for most covered Part B drugs from 95% of AWP to 85% of AWP. In 2005, the MMA again revised the drug payment methodology by creating a new pricing system based on a drug's average sales price, or ASP. Effective January 2005, Medicare pays for the majority of Part B covered drugs using a drug payment methodology based on ASP. In accordance with Section 1847A of the Social Security Act, manufacturers submit to us the ASP for their products. These data include the manufacturer's total sales, 
in dollars and number of units of a drug to all purchasers in the United States in a calendar quarter except certain sales exempted by the statute with limited exceptions. The sales price is net of discounts such as volume discounts, prompt pay discounts, cash discounts, free goods that are contingent on any purchase requirement, chargebacks and rebates other than rebates under section 1927 of the Act. The Medicare payment rate is based on 106 percent of ASP or for single source drugs 100 percent of 106 percent of the wholesale acquisition cost which is whack if that's lower less applicable deductible and coinsurance. The WAC is defined with respect to a drug or biological as the manufacturer's list price for the drug or biological to wholesalers or direct purchasers in the United States, not including prompt pay or other discounts, rebates, or reductions in price for the most recent month for which information is available as reported in wholesale price guides or other publications of drug or biological pricing data. So after carefully examining Section 1847A of the Act as established in the MMA, CMS has been reviewing its coding and pricing determinations to ensure that separate and appropriate payment is made for single source drugs and biologics as required by this section of the Act. In order to facilitate separate and appropriate payment, it may be necessary to create unique HCPCS Level 2 codes for certain products and as part of this effort, we are closely reviewing how we operationalize the terms single source drug, multiple source drug, and biological product in the context of payment under Section 1847A to identify the potential need to make any changes to our assignment of national drug codes to billing codes for payment purposes. So that we can implement coding and pricing changes swiftly, CMS has used and will continue to use its internal process when appropriate for modifying the code set. Please be aware that internally generated code requests are not part of the HCPCS public meeting process. The MMA exempted certain drugs from the ASP pricing methodology and payment for these drugs remain at 95 percent of AWP and these drugs include vaccines, infusion drugs furnished through DME and blood and blood products other than blood clotting factor. The payment methodology for radiopharmaceuticals did not change under the MMA. Specific, specifically, Section 303H states that nothing in the amendment shall be construed as changing the payment methodology for radiopharmaceuticals. And finally, Medicare pays a dispensing fee to a pharmacy for inhalation drugs furnished through DME, a supplying fee to a pharmacy for each supplied prescription of immunosuppressive drugs, oral anti-cancer drugs, and oral anti-emetic drugs used as part of an anti-cancer chemotherapeutic regimen, or a furnishing fee per unit of clotting factor to entities that furnish blood clotting factor unless the costs of furnishing the blood clotting factor are paid through another payment system. And the implement implementation of Medicare Part D did not change Medicare Part B drug coverage in any way. Drugs that were covered by Medicare Part B prior to the implementation of Part D continue to be covered by Medicare Part B. Thank you very much and have a great day. All right. Thank you, Anne, for those wonderful comments and uh, that, that nice description that you gave of the process. Uh, at this time, I would like to introduce other CMS HCPCS staff. Many of you have had a phone conversation or an in-person meeting with one of these staff at one time or another. When I uh, call your name, I would like for you to stand, please. First, I would like to introduce Jennifer Carver. She is CMS's National HCPCS Public Meeting Coordinator. and Lori Jackson, who's also a member of the HCPCS staff. <laughs> CMS HCPCS work group coordinators and meeting coordinators and public meeting coordinators come together and they work very hard to put together all of the thousands of details necessary in order to provide this opportunity for public comment. Um, I would like to also say that Jen is responsible for opening the meeting to a wider audience this year by instituting the live stream for these meetings. Thank you, Jen. 
I'd like to also introduce at this time Dr. Subhash Dugarala. He is the medical advisor to the CMS HICPICS work group. <laughs> Last but not least, we'd like to recognize the man behind the booth. He is Charles Hirsch. We'd like to say thank you for so professionally handling all of our audio visual, visual needs on today. Now I would like to take the time to describe how the meeting will proceed. Everyone should have received the meeting agenda upon sign-in. If you have not received one, there are still some out on the desk. For each item on today's agenda, there's a written, written summary of the application and CMS's preliminary coding decision and the agenda. The meeting will proceed one agenda item at a time until we have completed the agenda. We will hear a presentation from the registered primary speaker, and if there is one, the five-minute speakers. And we would like to ask that you will hold all questions until we have heard from both the primary and the five-minute speakers. We ask that every speaker state who you represent and your relationship to the applicant and to the manufacturer. Please let us know if you have any vested interests. Declare in your oral presentation and in your written summary whether or not you have any financial involvement or competitors of any items or services being discussed. This includes payment, salary, or benefits provided to the speaker by the manufacturer. We would like you to state whether you agree or disagree with the preliminary decision and in summarizing your comments, state your rationale for agreement or disagreement. After we've heard from all registered speakers, we will invite discussion and questions specifically related to that agenda item. Excuse me for one second. Now I would like to call forth our first agenda item, item number one, attachment number 14.024, request to establish a new level two HCPCS code to identify an acellular dermal matrix, trade name Helical. Primary speaker is Jeremy Gove of Continent Technologies, LLC. Just use that. Good morning, my name is Jeremy Gove, and I'm the CEO of MCT Medical Solutions, and we have the exclusive distribution rights for Helical in the United States. I want to thank you for the opportunity to come before you to discuss the application for a specific Q code for Helical. We believe a specific Q code is absolutely necessary for Helical, and without it, Helical is at a disadvantage in the marketplace when compared to other skin substitutes comprised of uh, collagen in the marketplace. As you know, the preliminary decision by the work group is that a Q code is not necessary due to the availability of the A codes, which are A6021 through A6023, which are assigned to collagen wound dressings. We believe that this decision was based on some misleading information in the code application, as well as a misunderstanding of what Helical is, how it works, and how it is used by professionals in the marketplace. Helical is a skin substitute and not a wound dressing. Here are just six of the many reasons why we make this claim. Number one, unlike a wound dressing, Helical stimulates tissue regeneration in chronic wounds due to the bioactive nature of the full molecules of type one collagen. Helical can also be sutured or stapled in place, much like you would do with an autologous skin graft. Number two, Helical is recognized as a skin substitute by the AHRQ in their technology assessment titled, Skin Substitutes for Treating Chronic Wounds. Number three, Helical is currently marketed and sold for use as a skin substitute to hospitals where it is used in both the inpatient and outpatient side of the facility. Helical is completely incorporated into the wound bed and is not removed as a dressing would be. In fact, additional applications, should they be necessary, are applied directly over any remaining collagen in the wound bed. Number five, dressings can be changed and applied by the patient, where Helical must be applied under a doctor's supervision and must be prescribed and not purchased over the counter. Helical is similar to other skin substitutes which have been assigned specific Q codes. 
As I mentioned earlier, helical, like other skin substitutes, stimulates tissue regeneration as it provides the matrix for the patient's natural growth factors to attach to. As you can see in picture A, on the left, once applied, the helical matrix becomes proliferated with the patient's natural growth factors, and by day four or five, the collagen is consistently incorporated into the wound bed. In picture B, you can see the incorporation of the collagen into the wound bed. The neovascularization and incorporation of the collagen was assessed through histological and electron microscopic studies. As you can see in picture B, the only way to remove helical at this point would be with sharp debridement. It is actually incorporated into the wound. As continued evidence that helical is incorporated into the wound bed, becoming part of the new tissue formation, you can see in the picture on the right, after the helical application, that acute inflammatory cells, fibroblasts, and blood vessels have proliferated into the collagen matrix. This picture was taken five days after application. The picture on the left, prior to helical, you can see that only fibroadipose tissue is available in the wound surface. Helical, as mentioned before, is used inpatient in the OR. When used in the OR, helical is typically sutured or stapled in place, an attribute that is typical of other skin substitutes. As you can see with the surgical wound or donor site, helical was applied in the OR. You can see that hel the helical collagen matrix is getting absorbed by the underlying wound tissue on day one. That process begins. On day five, you can see that helical is incorporated into the wound, and by day seven, there's very little collagen visible. Again, at this point, if it were deemed necessary, an additional application of helical would be applied to the new, and the new application would be placed right over the top of any remaining collagen in the wound. You can see in the bottom picture that by day 10, helical has been completely incorporated into the wound and is now part of the healthy tissue that is formed. As previously mentioned, the AHRQ has recognized helical as a skin substitute. In the AHRQ technology assessment referenced earlier, they were tasked by the Agency of Healthcare to define skin substitutes. They started with products that you have assigned Q codes to in the past and then added a few other similar products, including helical. In the technology assessment, the AHRQ's definition of a true skin substitute is a true skin substitute would act like an autologous skin graft and adhering to the wound while providing the physiological and mechanical functions of normal skin. According to that definition, helical is a true skin substitute. In our communication with the FDA in April 2013, helical was also referred to as a biological skin substitute, and we also submitted additional scientific evidence to back up that fact. In that same communication with the FDA, it was also mentioned that the new product description biological skin substitute was consistent with several other currently existing skin substitute products. The competitor examples that were given are products that you've already assigned Q codes to. Please note that Integra and Primatrix are also composed of type one collagen. Integra bilayer, which was Q4104 or is Q4104, matrix and wound matrix Q4119, Oasis Ultra Q4102, and Primatrix Q4110, and Unite Biomatrix Q4129. In this table, you can see helical compared to other products just mentioned. From left to right, you have helical Int Integra, Matristem, Oasis, Primatrix, and Unite Biomatrix. You can see that each of these products received a 510K from the FDA. You can also see that on the product code line, that each of them were given code KGN. And you can also see that all of the products are unclassified in the regulatory classification line. All of the products have the exact same indications for use. I also would like to note that Integra and Permatrix are comprised of bovine collagen, which you can see in the device description row. Permatrix is actually listed in two columns because I wanted to show that Primatrix originally was assigned the A codes, A6021 through A6023, as Helical has been, but then was assigned a specific Q code later on. This is what we are requesting to receive for Helical. 
As I mentioned earlier, the helical is used by professionals both on the inpatient outpatient side after the standard of care has failed in the same manner as many other skin substitutes are utilized. Again, helical can either be sutured or stapled in place, which is an attribute typically found in skin substitutes and not collagen dressings. Helical is also used under negative pressure wound therapy to help kickstart tissue regeneration, which is a distinguishing factor from most other skin substitutes. A collagen wound dressing would not be used under negative pressure therapy because as it dissolves, it would get pulled into the sponge or whatever dressing is utilized. I want to clarify a couple of items in the application that we submitted. The product name shown in the application was Helical Collagen Wound Dressing. This phrase was inaptly borrowed from the FDA classification and has provided much confusion. The Helical product name has been updated to show collagen-based sterile membrane bioengineered skin substitute to help clarify what helical really is. In question number 13 of the application relating to sales breakdown, this was also shown with a flawed methodology. As you can see, the correct sales breakdown is 50% to hospitals for the inpatient use, 40% to hospitals for the outpatient use, 5% to skilled nursing facilities, and 5% to freestanding ambulatory care clinics. In closing, I would like to mention once again, helical is a skin substitute and not a collagen wound dressing. In addition to being sutured or stapled in place, helical has the same indications as other collagen products that have been assigned a Q code. Helical is used as a skin substitute by providers across America when treating Medicare and private insurance patients with difficult to heal chronic wounds and burns. Without a specific Q code, helical is at a disadvantage in the marketplace. To be considered a reimbursable skin substitute by the max, you need to have a specific Q code. A specific Q code is necessary for providers to be able to distinguish which skin substitute they use in the treatment of the wound. Specific Q codes have already been assigned to collagen-based skin substitutes, Prematrix and Tegra, and Integra as well as others. Shortly, you will hear from Dr. Gunasakaran, the inventor of Helical. Dr. Gunasakaran was involved with the FDA committee headed by Dr. David Kaplan where he raised the technical point that type 1 collagen cannot be made using recombinant methods, as two genes are involved in the preparation of each molecule. Also, Dr. Gunasakaran was an integral part of the ASTM Standards Committee to produce the standard guide for characterization of type 1 collagen for surgical implants and substrates for tissue-engineered medical products. That ASTM designation is F2212-09. And with that, I would like to open it up to questions or the secondary speaker. Thank you very much. Oh, yes, please. Okay, so for item number one, there are no primary speakers. We will take questions at this time. For item number, for number one, your name is here. All right, so I apologize. There is one, one five-minute speaker. His name is Subramanian Gunasakaran. Thank you. Good morning <coughs> to everyone. Um, I'm Subra Gunasakaran, and I'm the president and CEO of the company Encol Corporation and the inventor of the product Helicol. Uh, <clears throat> based on the presentation of Jeremy, uh, one may easily foresee the need for the Q41XX code for Helicol. It is well established that helical is not used as a wound dressing that is usually applied and later removed and acting only as a wound cover. On the contrary, helical need not be removed from the wound bed but instead is getting incorporated into the new tissue 
being formed, which is characteristic of biological skin substitutes. Helical has specific clinical findings to prove the product gets resorbed while new cells and vasculature incorporates within four to five days, leading to faster skin regeneration and healing of the wound. As a scientist for over 34 years, I would like to provide a few technical reasoning about the, <clears throat> the misconcepts prevail in the medical industry that a device is accepted as a skin substitute if any biological tissue is made acellular by destroying the cells and claiming the, <clears throat> the retention of bioactive molecules in the intact tissue construct. We all know there is a significant amount of elastin, keratin, fibrin, and other potential immunogenic molecules, including type 3 collagen in every uh, intact tissue. For example, elastin forms at least one-sixth of the collagen uh, is <coughs> in a given connective tissue like pericardium, allograft skin, intestinal submucosa, or amnion. Please answer me if any such acellularized tissue with significantly immunogenic elastin and other molecules in the device, how one can make the product acceptable in the host tissue without chemically mutilating or knowingly or unknowingly cross-linking the biological molecules in such constructs to minimize the immunogenicity? This is a question for all scientifically tuned minds to ask themselves. The immunogenicity of such, a mole such molecules can be verified in just the publicly available PDB protein data bank domain websites based on the homology differences between species and the abundance of immunogenic uh, am, uh, amino acid cysteine in all such molecules, including type 2 collagen, type 3 collagens. The only structural molecule that has the high degree of homology across the different species is type 1 collagen. That is what understood by NCOL, and accordingly the construct has been devised to s show such efficiency in product uh, that has <coughs> tissue infiltration capab capabilities within four to five days. No other construct has such a fast incorporation rate as far as the public information made available for such constructs. This conceptual understanding would make anyone to realize how and why helical is better bioaccepted immediately in the host tissue com <coughs> compared to other advanced skin substitute constructs. The following are the reasons why helical has to be considered as a skin substitute that requires a unique independent Q41XX code. The <coughs> it's purified to contain only type 1 collagen, which is non-allergenic to host tissues, further treated to remove possible allergenic components by enzymatic TTP process that is patented. The, <coughs> the product obtains its membrane strength through a physical processing step avoiding the need for chemical cross-linking of the collagen strands so that the bioactivity of the native collagen molecule is maintained. Additional processing steps make uh, helical to naturally attract bioactive molecules and there is no need to add more growth factors or MMPs to achieve better clinical outcome. Such a unique bioactivity is clinically documented through infiltration of new blood vessels and regenerative cells to, the, um, to begin the granulation tissue within four to five days, resulting in faster wound healing. Unlike other products that are made acellular that still retain, uh, retaining highly immunogenic elastin in their construct, helical is nothing but least immunogenic, immunogenic type one collagen. Three years of shelf life is another unique feature of Helical that is not offered by many other advanced Q41XX coded products in the market. Helical also known to reduce patient pain levels significantly, a serious factor for burn patients. For um, the uh, same uh, <coughs> or better clinical outcome in general, Helical seems to be more cost effective than the other such products. The basic requirement of skin substitute is well made by the helical clinically proven to close chronic and uh, difficult to heal wounds. The need for helical is further demonstrated in the application for <coughs> a, a unique Q41XX code. Uh, based upon the published decision tree designated by the CMS, in our opinion, a new Q41XX 
HIGPIX code is fully supported for Helicol. Thank you. Sorry for that. All right. At this time, we will take any questions. We would like to ask that you will use the microphone that's in the middle aisle, please. Felicia, do I have to get in the middle aisle? <laughs> I'm just going to talk from here. Um, I just, I'm not sure I have questions as much as, as uh, comments. Um, one, it, 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 and thank you for your presentation, by the way, uh, Mr. Gove. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to make a point that there's, your slide indicates that the FDA has classified uh, Helical as a skin substitute, and it did not. It's, it's unclassified. And, and the indication for use is collagen dressing, as are the predicate products. So I just wanted to make that clear for the whole room because, because there's a lot of thought in, in here today wrapped around this whole notion of skin substitutes. So I just, when, when I hear that, you know, an attribution to a federal agency that's not exactly accurate, I just wanted to bring it up. I appreciate that. that sure. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, the other thing is that um, AHRQ, um, in doing that technology assessment for us, they weren't hired to define skin substitutes, nor, nor did they, I don't think. I think they took a shot at it and we asked them not to, or maybe they did something for their own internal use that was never adopted by CMS, but they weren't hired to define skin substitutes. Um, they were hired to look at, at um, uh, clinical information available to see if they could uh, determine whether there was um, or clinical studies that would demonstrate that any of the products were more effective than, than any of the others under the heading of what CMS is unfortunately termed skin substitutes, but we never did define it. Um, also, I don't see any other information in your application that the name of the product has been changed. And in your conclusion slide, you, you reiterate your original request for a code that uses the name Helicol. So can you clarify that for me, please? The name has not been changed, only the name calling. Uh, in other words, you know, instead of the product is being called as a, as a skin dressing, it is addressed as a, a biological skin substitute. That's what uh, it refers to. I'm sorry. Are there any other questions or comments? Um, you listed all of the um, places where your product is used. Mm -hmm. um, it's not used outside of a facility at all? There's no um, office or like wound care center type use? Well, that, yeah, the wound care centers would be the outpatient side of the hospitals. But not anything that's not affiliated with the facility? Not at this point, no. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Agenda item number two, request to establish a new level two HCPCS code to identify decellularized dermal allograft, trade name Dermapur. There are no primary speakers for this item. We do have one five-minute speaker, Patty Gary of Tissue Regenerix. Hi, good morning. My name is Patty Gary, and I'm the Director of Clinical Affairs with Tissue Regenix, which is the manufacturer of Dermapure. Um, and on behalf of the company, would just like to say that we agree with the decision to preliminarily grant um, a Hicks PIX level two code. Um, and we'd like to thank you for that. We think that this will provide access to healthcare providers to be able to provide this beneficial decellularized dermal allograph to patients with acute and chronic wounds. So thank you. Agenda item number three, request to establish two, level, two new level two HCPCS codes to identify human placental connective tissue matrix to be marketed under the trade names Dermavest and Dermavest II. Primary speaker, Daniel Grade of Feinstein Institute. Good morning. 
uh, Hex Picks Code uh, um, panel. I appreciate the opportunity to speak today. My name is Daniel Grandy. I'm a PhD scientist. I am a director of orthopedic research at the Feinstein Institute, Department of Orthopedic Surgery at the North Shore LIJ Health System in New York. And I am a consultant to Adacel as well as a stockholder. Adacel respectfully disagrees with the preliminary decision of the CMS uh, working group. Uh, Dermavest is a human allograft tissue composed of human placental disc, amnion, chorion, and umbilical cord in a particularized form. As a 361 regulated tissue, Dermavest has been minimally manipulated to remove cellular material and contamination like other skin substitutes including those derived from amnion and chorion, umbilical cord, and cadaver skin. Dermavest should not be classified as a collagen dressing because Dermavest contains growth factors and ECM proteins that aid in wound healing and that collagen dressings do not. Dermavest placental connective tissue matrix as a 361 human tissue products that have been granted HICPICS codes are comprised of ordinary human connective tissue, including amnion, chorion, umbilical cord, cadaver skin. The FDA tissue reference group update of 2004 states that decellularized particulate human placental connective tissue matrix intended to replace or supplement damaged or inadequate integumental tissue is considered a 361 HCTP. Uh, the term connective tissue is not synonymous with collagen. Ordinary connective tissue is more than collagen. As you can see in this diagram here, uh, collagen comp comprises 40 to 60 percent of human skin. The collagen content of Dermavest is in this range. In side-by-side -side testing, Graft jacket shows to have over 25% more collagen per milligram than Dermavest. Graft jacket is classified as a skin, as a skin substitute and has been granted its own, its own HixPix code. Dermavest contains the other ECM proteins and growth factors that are important for cell migration and, po and repopulation. Things like a protein, ECM proteins like fibronectin, which helps uh, it cells adhere to the scaffold, uh, proteoglycan to allow for water uh, retention within that, as well as laminin. The, this skin substitute um, integrates also within the wound site. As you can see here, um, with regards to immunohistochemistry, uh, stained specifically for fibronectin, you see on the left panel uh, pre-processed placental disc, amnion, chorion, and umbilical cord in a particularized form prior to processing. And you can see there that you have very strong staining positive for fibronectin. The Dermavest product, after it's been processed, also contains uh, a large amount of fibronectin, as can be seen by the very positive staining there. Now, Fibrocol, which is 90% uh, collagen, dr collagen dressing, you can see that it contains very little um, fibronectin within its scaffold matrix. Uh, another example, uh, immunohistochemistry looking at laminin, and again on the left side panel you can see pre-processed tissue uh, of placental disc and amnion as well in a particularized form, also staining very positively for laminin, and then following uh, processing our Dermavest product shows uh, very positive staining for laminin, and again, compared to Fibrocol collagen dressing, which is virtually absent positive staining for laminin. So in conclusion, uh, Dermavest is different than a collagen dressing. It is comprised of the same type of tissue as other amnion placental skin substitutes. It's regulated the same as other skin, skin substitutes from amniotic and, chorea, and placental tissue. It's used in the same manner as an amnion placental based skin substitute. 
like, uh, like these other products in that it contains other materials not found in collagen dressings such as growth factors and other ECM products. Dermavest should be signed a Q code consistent with the coding precedents set with the, the establishment of Q codes for other amniotic placental tissue based uh, skin substitutes. Thank you for your time. There are no five minute speakers for this item. We would like to invite questions at this time. Once again, uh, this is uh, uh, Guna Gunasekaran from NCOL. Uh, the question is, uh, this is not only specifically for uh, you, but addressing to all the uh, future speakers who are all promoting the uh, a cellular or decellularized tissue, intact tissue, claiming that it contains all the um, uh, all the constituents like elastin, fibronectin, or, or laminins. How do you able to control the immunogenicity of these molecules? We all know, technically speaking, these molecules are uh, relatively highly immunogenic compared to type 1 collagen. Okay? So if you are entertaining the incorporation of these, th these uh, components in the construct, once again, it is not your fault, but it has been traditionally used that once when we decellularize any of these tissues that can be used as a uh, skin substitute, which is a wrong concept in my opinion. Scientifically and technically, we can argue on that, but uh, as the, uh, the promoter of the product, do you have any answer to that? How do you minimize the <coughs> immunogenicity of such molecules? Um, we've done a, an enormous amount of testing preclinically and have not seen any immune response in our, in our uh, m models that we've used. So I'm not sure that uh, there is an, an acute re immune response from that particular molecule. Okay, what it tells me is, no, I mean, uh, for example, even the cadaver skin tissue, which is a, um, um, uh, uh, <coughs> which is allograft uh, or, or the is, uh, yeah, allograft material, okay, they are all going through a process called uh, cross-linking. They are preserving that in uh, aldehyde, like a formaldehyde solution, which is naturally cross-linking all the surface chemistry, so it tolerates and it doesn't exert any immunogenicity because all the surface sites are what they call the epitopes are all blocked and that is the reason it is being tolerated in the in the host tissue but it doesn't mean that it is um, uh, having the same amount of the native uh, bioactivity of the particular collagen like type 1 collagen which is non-immunogenic in my opinion thank you any other questions Agenda item number four, request to establish a new level two HCPCS code to identify a human amniotic membrane allograft. Trade name, BioVance. Primary speaker, Jody Gurney. Good morning. I'm Jody Gurney. I'm the vice president of clinical and medical affairs for Celgene Corporation. You may ask, who the heck is Celgene Corporation? They are a biotech company that focuses primarily on oncology and hematology, which again, um, you may question why I'm here today. We also have developed an amniotic membrane product called BioVance, which we will discuss. Um, and we have, I'm speaking on, the, on behalf of Aliqua Biomedical, who is our commercial partner for this product, because again, we are an oncology company. <clears throat> And maybe I can work the slides here too. Aliqua Biomedical, in case you're not familiar, is an advanced wound care company that's located in Langhorne, Pennsylvania. They have a complete suite of products and multiple commercial partnerships, including Celgene. What I'd like to do is walk you through the presentation today. We'll talk about Aliqua's application for a, a HixPix code your preliminary decision, our concerns about that decision, as well as an explanation of what BioVance actually is. Um, we will summarize with details on BioVance and I'll take any questions that you may have. 
Just to remind you, Aliqua Biomedical put in the application for a new Q code for BioVance. The HixPix workgroup preliminary decision was that this would get an A code for a collagen wound dressing. We have several concerns about this preliminary decision, and our concerns revolve around the, the basis that BioVance is a human amnion allograft. It does meet the characteristics of a human tissue product. It has been regulated and designated as a human tissue product by the FDA, and it does not have the characteristics of collagen dressing products, which have been given A codes. We'll talk about the regulatory, biologic, functional, and technological differences between BioVance and products that have A codes. Also, based upon our research, it appears that all human tissue products have been assigned Q codes that are similar to BioVance. As mentioned, BioVance is a human amnion allograft. It is derived from biological tissue, which is the human placenta. These are the product of full-term healthy pregnancies. It is applied only by a qualified healthcare professional. It requires the necessary expertise and clinical skills for use. It does incorporate wholly into the wound and is not removed when you do secondary dressing changes. It supports natural restoration of functional tissue and has all the qualifications of amnion membranes which minimize inflammation and reduce scarring. We have studied the product in multiple wound types. I was uh, leading the clinical program. We studied all of the different types of collagen vascular ulcers, including diabetic, venous ulcers, arterial collagen ulcers, and also acute uh, wounds, burns, traumatic wounds, surgical wounds. Again, BioVance supports the healthy uh, natural tissue restoration by incorporating the whole amnion into the uh, regenerating tissue of the wound. From a regulatory perspective, the FDA views BioVance as a human tissue product. Just to uh, make sure everyone knows what these are, uh, these are human um, cell tissues or cellular tissue-based products. The FDA gives these a regulatory designation, and tissues like BioVance are regulated under Section 361 of the Public Health Safety Act. BioVance is registered and regulated by the FDA. Um, human tissues under 361 are not subject to FDA pre-market review requirements like devices, like 510K devices or pharmaceuticals. BioVance is minimally, minimally manipulated. What that means is that it's simply processed. It's a single amnion tissue, which is processed to maintain the natural architecture, integrity, and function of the tissue. The labeling must be consistent with homologous use. What this means is this is tissue replacing tissue. It cannot be combined with any other products in manufacturing. This is a human amniotic allograft. And it does not have a systemic effect. As mentioned, uh, based upon our research, we feel that all other FDA designated human tissue products have been assigned Q codes. Why is BioVance different technologically from A-coded collagen dressings? Again, this is a decellularized, dehydrated human amniotic allograft. It is marketed as a 361 product, as mentioned. It is indicated as a human allograft, and it's to replace damaged tissue. It does provide the epithelial basement membrane and extracellular matrix, as well as multiple other uh, additive, additive natural substance, fibronectin, elastin, proteoglycans, GAGs, and multiple types of collagen. As we know, most of the A-coded collagen dressings do not contain these type of substances. BioVance also provides an extracellular matrix, so it supports cellular repair and migration and helps to restore natural tissue. Processing. This is important. BioVance is a human tissue, so it's minimally manipulated. What this means and how this is depicted for you is we take a human placenta 
the amnion is taken off of the placenta and it's simply processed where the end result is uh, one by one these tissues are processed it's one product which is processed to the end it maintains the natural architecture integrity and function of that amniotic tissue matrix in contrast when you look at the technological and processing aspects of uh, collagen dressings that receive A coatings. If we again go over the minimal manipulation of the human tissue biovance, you take the amnion, which has the native ECM, it's simply processed, minimal manipulation, where the end result, um, the processing is done by hand and it's one single tissue as the result. Collagen dressings are typically done in lots with multiple animal sources. Often that product is denatured or processed down to a single collagen source. Um, this is typically done with multiple sources that are pulled and it's manufactured. It's not minimally manipulated. BioVance does not have the technological, functional, or structural characteristics of collagen dressings. Collagen dressings, which receive A codes, are not interactive. They don't incorporate into the wound. They also do not exert any direct biological effect. They are typically removed upon inspection um, with secondary dressing changes, and they can often be applied by the caregiver or the patient themselves. I'd like to again walk through the different characteristics of BioVance, a human tissue, versus collagen dressings, which typically receive an A code. Collagen dressings do not incorporate into the wound. They often re require repeat changing, sometimes up to three times per week, and their purpose is to shield the wound environment. They do not exert a direct biological effect. Collagen dressings are removed from the wound, um, and they, this can be done by the patient themselves. They can be applied by caregivers and not necessarily a healthcare professional. BioVance is a human tissue. It can only be applied by a qualified healthcare professional. It requires clinical expertise and skills for use. It is minimally manipulated. It is not manufactured, and that is done so to maintain the natural architecture of the ECM matrix itself. It is derived from human biological tissue. These are human placental tissues, the product of full-term healthy pregnancies. BioVance, a human tissue, incorporates directly into the wound. It's not removed with any secondary dressing changes. Also, because it is a human tissue, it's tracked donor to recipient, every single tissue, just like any human allograft would be. In summary, we respectfully request that the Hicks Picks Work Group reconsider their preliminary decision and grant BioVance a unique Q code. BioVance is a human tissue as recognized by its characteristics as well as by its FDA designation. It is not a collagen dressing. Also included in your package, um, the folders from Aliqua Biomedical, we have included um, advocacy and clinical data from two very well-known and well-respected uh, advanced wound care physicians, both of, of who would have liked to have personally been here because of their strong support of the product. Um, I have included a letter from Dr. Bill Marston, which supports the coding uh, decision that we've requested, as well as the latest data from Dr. Terry Treadwell, which includes a study of 20 patients in burns and that was just uh, released at SAWC uh, this past, past month. I thank you for the opportunity to talk about BioVance, one of my favorite products, and uh, if anyone has any further questions. Go ahead. I, I, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm... Can I? I'm hoping you're going to ask me the question you're going to ask me. <laughs> <laughs> in, you know, it, it's very unfortunate. In order to promote the amniotic membrane product, you are undermining the collagen constructs. See, not I, all collagen constructs are considered as dressings. Please, 
please, now I want the committee to recognize this fact. And, and also, we have shown just you know, in a couple of presentations before you know, how a collagen construct, helical collagen construct, is well adopting the new intra or the tissue interaction with the underlying tissue, right? So it has been well evidenced. And also, this is very important, the conceptual change has to be made and understood by all of us to making sure that how and, uh, and, and the uh, criticality of the, uh, the immunogenicity of all these constructs, how certain collagen constructs are uh, highly uh, least immunogenic and having the interacting ability with the underlying tissue. So that's what I mean, you are pounding on to all collagen constructs as dressings. I'm sorry to hear that. No, I you may have also, noticed I didn't say all. I said most. But, but you have generalizing all collagen as dressings. That's wrong. That's all I'm trying to say. Um, what I was attempting to do is actually specify the A-coded dressings yeah, that's right. See, um, where yeah, my but, uh, product is not. Because um, no, uh, but the, the way in which you are mentioning that as if the reviewers will, uh, will uh, take it granted that uh, all collagen uh, constructs are dressings. That's the wrong concept. I'm sorry to say this out loud. Thank you. That's okay. Thank you. Okay, so there were no five minute speakers for item number four. At this time, if there aren't any other questions, we will take a 15 minute coffee break and return at 10.30. 1045, I'm sorry.
Okay, if we can have everyone to settle down, please. We're getting ready to continue. Continue. Okay, agenda item number five, attachment number 14.38. Request to establish a new level two HCPCS code to identify a cryopreserved injectable allograph. Trade name, New Cell. Primary speaker is Howard Walthall. Good morning and thanks for giving me the opportunity to speak. My name is Howard Walthall. I am the president and CEO of NewTech Medical. NewTech is a privately owned group of allografts and medical device companies focusing on wound care as well as orthopedic surgical applications. NewTech believes that uh, new cell should be given a unique Q code and for that reason respectfully disagrees with the preliminary decision of the work group. I wanted to take just a few minutes to review why that is. What is new cell? New cell is a cryopreserved placental allograft prepared from human amniotic membrane. We've, we're going to hear a lot about that today, I think. And from the uh, amniotic fluid. It's minimally processed and regulated by the FDA as a 361 tissue, as the other allograft products are. It is delivered in a liquid form and may be mixed with saline for application in the wound bed. Uh, it's packaged for sterile, for sterile use and available in four sizes. How is it used? It may be applied to the wound bed as a covering. Uh, injection is not required, although that's, that's a possible use to enhance healing and to provide a covering for the wound to support wound healing. Our coding request was the following uh, for a Q code, new cell injectable 0.5 cc's. The work group preliminary coding decision indicated that a national program operating need was not identified. We disagree with this decision for three reasons. Um, first of all, uh, there is, of course, currently no unique code assigned to new cell for, for tracking or reimbursement purposes. Second, new cell usage is increasing in the chronic wound and outpatient clinic setting. And third, other similar products have already been assigned Q codes or have been recommended for a Q code. So uh, new cell is increasingly being used in the treatment of chronic wounds in the outpatient setting and the inpatient setting. Uh, new cell has been on the market as an HCTP since 2009, primary using being in the inpatient surgical and surgery center setting. But this uh, uh, mix, uh, mix of use is shifting now as there's much more interest in the wound care space. So new cell is being increasingly used in wound care, both acute and chronic. And of course, many chronic wounds being treated on an outpatient basis. We expect usage in the chronic wound area to continue to grow. Clinical studies involving the use of new cell to treat both acute and chronic wounds are ongoing and planned. Similar products have been assigned Q codes already. In uh, last year's coding cycle, the uh, amnio matrix and bio-D matrix were, was assigned Q code Q4139. This is a very similar product derived from the same basic sources and used in the same way. Epifix injectable, which is a uh, amniotic membrane product, also for similar use. Similar products have also received prom positive preliminary decisions in this coding cycle, Neox Flow and Clarix Flow which into item number nine being two examples. So in summary, we believe that new cell should be assigned a unique Q code for tracking reimbursement. Of course, there is no code available now. Utilization is increasing in the appropriate space of outpatient and wound clinic for the treatment of wounds. And similar products have already been assigned Q codes. That's all I have, thank you. There are no five-minute speakers for this item. Uh, do you have any questions at this time? Hi. 
Thank you very much yes, for your talk. Um, you say that the use in the outpatient is increasing. Do you have numbers that reflect? Yeah, I mean, that? admittedly, the numbers are still small. We've only been pursuing the wound care market for a relatively short period of time. But we do see usage picking up in the military hospital system, the VA system, and in hospital outpatient settings where the inpatient use is driving use into the outpatient setting also. So it's a, still a small number at this point, though. Any use in non-facility type settings? Not currently. I, I think, you know, one problem is the code is sort of a, a, a need that you, something you need to go see wound clinic doctors about using the product. So there's a little bit of a chicken and the egg problem there. But we do see, at, you know, as these studies come out and we pursue it in other markets, we expect to take it into the wound uh, clinic setting also. With no other questions, uh, thank you for your time. Agenda item number six, attachment number 14.46. Request to establish four new level two HCPCS codes to identify variant thicknesses of acellular tissue surgical mesh devices. Trade names Matristem Surgical Matrix RS, PSM, PSMX and Thick Mesh. Primary speaker, Corey West. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Corey West. I'm the product manager for the new advanced wound care division at ACEL. Um, first, I just want to start out. Um, there is a, a correction to be made on the agenda item. Um, we're actually requesting six new level two HCPCS codes, and I'll go through them in detail. All right, so we're actually just right down the road here in Columbia. It only took me about 15 minutes to get here today. So um, we have our corporate headquarters here, and we also have a facility in Indiana. Uh, we are, have a proprietary extracellular matrix, ECM, uh, and we've had clinical devices both in wound care and surgical devices since 2009. Matristem urinary bladder matrix, we are the only commercially available urinary bladder matrix available. Um, just a little background on extracellular matrix, but before I get started, um, I want to just go a step further into, into clearly articulating the difference between our surgical products and our wound products, which has been part of the confusion, um, which is why we're here to disagree with the decision. So um, our products range from head to toe. I like to think of it that way. We have wound care products that are used on chronic wounds, acute wounds, in the outpatient setting. And we also have surgical products that are used for uh, reinforcement of soft tissue. So two very different applications. Uh, and I want to be able to show you why we think it's important that each of those products used in each of those indications are assigned a different Q code. Okay. So ECM, um, we're acellular. Uh, we are a network of collagens, proteoglycans, growth factors, and uh, we mediate cell interaction. So we're able to send signals to these cells uh, and tell them where they should go, recruit progenerator cells to the site so we can, so we can get healing. So what is a urinary bladder matrix? So we are a biphasic design. Uh, on one side is the basement membrane. It's fully intact epithelial basement membrane. The other side is the tunica propria. Uh, we have been, uh, it has been suggested that we promote angiogenesis to the wound or to the surgical site. Uh, recruitment of progenerator cells take place in that tunica propria layer. It appears that some of these peptides that uh, construct the ECM itself have antibacterial properties. Uh, we gradually degrade into the patient's body, so there's nothing to be removed. Um, in terms of tissue remodeling, uh, constructive remodeling, we, so, so in terms of macrophage phenotypes, um, the M1 pathway is, has been associated with uh, scar formation. The M2 form, uh, pathway has been associated with constructive remodeling. And we've shown in animal models that we're able to take the patient's body down the M2 pathway. Uh, so we're able to regenerate site-specific tissue, uh, which leads to less recurrence uh, and, and healthier, uh, more viable tissue. 
Okay, so here we get to the differences between our indications. So you can see I've spelled it out on the, on the left side here are wound products. And, and the indications are as follows for wound products. And this would be your diabetic foot ulcers, your decubitus ulcers, your venous stasis ulcers, um, trauma wounds, draining wounds, surgical wounds, you know, dehist surgical wounds, anything outside the body is on that left-hand side of the page. However, if we shift gears and go to the right side and we look at our surgical products, these products are actually not indicated for outside the body. So we currently, if we used our, these surgical products on a wound, that would be considered an off-label use of the product. As it stands today, the Q codes for the surgical products on the right-hand side are grouped in with the wound products. So you can see why we believe that there's confusion there because we're using the same Q code for a surgical product as we are for a wound product with two clearly different indications. Uh, and just to cover our surgical indications, we reinforce soft tissue in urology, gynecology, pelvic floor, gastroenterology, and uh, abdominal wall. So I took it a step further just to kind of give you a visual of how we identify our products. Um, we currently have three Q codes. We have Q4118, 4119, and 4120. Q4118 is that on the left-hand side, that matrix stem wound matrix one layer, one layer, or the, rather the matrix stem micromatrix micronized particle. That particle is a micronized uh, particulate version of our wound sheet, okay? And that has its own Q code. That's used, again, in wound applications outside the body. Q4119, as it stands today, is inclusive of matrix stem wound matrix one layer, but we also have our multi-layer grouped in, and we also have all of our surgical products being lumped into that same Q code, um, which hopefully at this point in the presentation we've started to see is, is not appropriate. Beyond that, today what we're requesting is the matrix stem multi-layer matrix, uh, two layer, which is a new product for us. Difference between the wound matrix and the multi layer matrix, again, very different. One is a one layer fenestrated product that would be used for more superficial wounds. The other is a two layer, one to one mesh lyophilized product that would be used for more full thickness rather than partial thickness, thickness type wounds. Um, moving on to our burn matrix, that actually has been assigned a code, which is Q4120. Um, that's used in burn applications. So we've got a burn product strictly by itself being assigned a Q code. Um, so again, from the wound side, what we're requesting today is the matrix stem multi-layer matrix to have its own unique Q code. On the right side here, this is where, again, going back to what I, I mentioned earlier, all of these devices in this gray area of my slide are lumped into the left side of the screen, which is major stem wound matrix. Um, again, these, these products are not indicated for wounds. They're indicated for soft tissue repair inside the body. Now, the majority of our business as a company in, 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 as it re relates to our discussions today, outpatient setting, ASC setting, uh, LTAC setting for advanced wound care and also veterans affairs, is on the left-hand side of that screen. However, there are many of the procedures on the right-hand side of the screen of abdominal wall repair, hernia repairs taking place in ASC surgical centers, places where we need to account for the type of product used, and we're not able to do that right now. So here's just a layout of our device brand names on the left-hand side with the indications. The, the thick black line in the middle is where we draw the line between our uh, our wound products and our surgical products. You can see there's a different 510K device for each of these products uh, and a completely different indication to the extent that we're actually off-label. I'll repeat that again if we're using surgical products on wounds. Okay, just to give you some um, perspective on our product and, and how it works again. Um, so a lot of these patients, because of the complexity of their wounds, we're seeing them move back and forth between the outpatient, inpatient, ASC, HOPD, you know, they're, Depending on the severity of the wound, they're moved back and forth quite often. Different products are used at different times. Um, we're often used where other devices are failed, that, failing, that are, in fact, getting reimbursement and have Q codes for, for, for other competing um, 
type, uh, other competing companies with, with similar products. Um, uh, so we've also, again, going back to the difference between partial and, and full thickness wounds, you can see this very last, well, actually, the first and the third slide here are examples of the full thickness wounds where we'd be using that multi-layer device that I mentioned that, as of today, does not have a Q code. So in summary, uh, here we've, we've spelled out exactly what we're asking for. You can see, as I've mentioned, we currently have three Q codes. We're request, requesting six additional. Here are the six listed here. The first is the matrix stem surgical matrix RS, which is a two-layer surgical device. The second is the matrix stem surgical matrix PSM, which is a three-layer device. Third would be the matrix stem surgical matrix PSMX, which is six. Matrix stem matrix thick, thick is eight. Multi-layer is a two-layer, one-to-one mesh, lyophilized. And the final is pelvic floor surgical matrix used in POP procedures, and that's a six-layer device. Um, we like to think of our wound products as being various thicknesses, uh, given the degree, the extent of the thickness of the wound that we're using it in. Um, on the contrary, we like to think of our surgical products as being various levels of strength. Again, another reason to identify each of these products listed here uh, per their strength, per a different Q code, for every level associated with it. So that's all I have. Any questions? Excuse me. Is there any reason to choose the uh, urinary bladder uh, versus other uh, tissue construct? Uh, is there any advantage you see for, or other like amnion or, or pericardium? Yeah, well, the dif dif differentiating parts of our product are, are one that we're fully intact basement membrane, right? So that ECM on one side, like I mentioned, is fully intact epithelial, right? Providing a scaffold and a, and a, and a, and a place for cells to come and proliferate and differentiate. Um, the other reason is because the, there have been studies to suggest, and, and if you've uh, done your research on urinary bladder, uh, that the urinary bladder matrix of a, pri uh, of a pig holds highly regenerative properties in and of itself. So it's able to push that, the person's body down, down a pathway of healing with their own stem cells versus using something else from outside yeah. the body. Yeah, the reason I'm asking, you know, bladder is highly expandable. So yeah. naturally it should contain more of elastin, which are highly immunogenic. So I was wondering whether how come you're able to control the immunogenicity of the elastin in your construct. You know. Anyway. You know. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, I have a question. Sure. A couple of them, actually. Where are you? Um, right here. Right. Okay, sorry. Where did, your, where did the pelvic floor surgical matrix come from? I, I, am I missing something? I didn't see that in your application. Yeah, so in the, the application was submitted in November, I believe. Um, since then, we've had some changes um, with the way that we, uh, again, because we're, because we're starting to see, based off of the feedback that I've received from our reimbursement department, that a lot of these procedures are starting to be performed in an ASC setting. Uh, and particularly given some of the talk that we've heard about the new uh, two midnight rule that we're approaching, some of these procedures could maybe in the future wind up happening uh, in one of the settings that would require a Q code. Um, so for pelvic floor, today I wanted to take the opportunity to take all of our products, differentiate each one of them, pelvic floor being one of them, and ask that each, given their, their, their differences for indications and applications, be assigned a, 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 a unique Q code. Okay, that would take a separate application. It was not included okay. in your current okay. application, in the Thank public you. floor one. Um, so I was wondering how you got to six and I had four, four yeah. plus a revision. Okay, yeah. that answers that. Now, did you say that the RS, PSM, and PSMX were for in the body only? I'm sorry, my, yes. my copy of your slide is tiny. Yeah. So if that's the case, then don't we have too many codes? Too many codes? We don't have codes for those products. I, oh, if they're for surgical implantation only, I mean, there is a code that, that uh, Q4119 we, includes those. Right, but that Q4119 is, is our wound matrix, which has a completely different indication than our surgical products. Our surgical products have indications for soft tissue repair versus wound. Is it the same product, different name, different sites of use? No, absolutely not. Different 510Ks. I can actually go back to that slide if you want to. And that's where the confusion, I mean, these are actually excellent questions, that's where the confusion is coming in. So these are, as you can see, 
surgical products are a completely different 510K application with different indication. Okay, so at least the, R the surgical RS PSM, PSMX, and thick mesh are for soft tissue surgical use Are only? for reinforcement of soft, soft tissue, right? They're used inside the body. What about the multi-layer? Multi-layer is, is a wound product, but it's different than the wound product. Uh, it's used for full thickness wounds. Uh, it's two layer versus one layer, and it's a one-to-one -one mesh product. Um, so again, very different types of, mm -hmm. it's used differently. Um, it wouldn't be, you know, if somebody were to code and, and use a Q4119 for a full thickness wound use of a one-to-one -one mesh two layer, we consider that to be a very different circumstance. Okay, thank Does you. Does that make sense? Um, I understand Hopefully. what you're saying. Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you. Okay, there were no five minute speakers for agenda item number six. Agenda item number seven, attachments number 14.53, request to establish a new level two HCPCS code to identify a human amniotic tissue allograft trade name Allorap DS, and attachment number 14.54, request to establish a new level two HCPCS code to identify a human amniotic tissue allograft, trade name Allorap DRY. There are no primary speaker and no five, five minute speaker for this item. Next, agenda item number eight, attachment number 14.58, Request to establish a new level two HCPCS code to identify human placental allografts, trade names Amnioban and Guardian. There is no primary speaker. There is one five minute speaker, Mr. Mark Jacobs. Thank you and good morning. Uh, my name is Mark Jacobs. I am an employee of MTF and serve the company as Vice President of Product Development within Research and Development. On behalf of the Musculoskeletal Transplant Foundation, I would like to thank the work group for their preliminary decision to assign a HCPCS code to describe the amnioban and guardian human placental allografts. As a nonprofit service organization, MTF is dedicated to providing quality tissue through a commitment to excellence in education, research, recovery, and care for recipients, donors, and their families. Amnioban and Guardian are derived from human tissue allografts prepared from donated placental membrane. Native human amnion and chorion together create a membrane covering in which the amnion serves as an epithelium layer for interior and exterior wounds. Creating a new HCPCS code for Amnioban and Guardian not only follows precedence, set by the agency for other skin substitute products, but further allows for product distinction to appropriately process claims. As the Vice President of Product Development for MTF, I value your decision and appreciate the opportunity this brings to physicians to provide a choice in their use of products for individual patient care. We appreciate the opportunity to submit comments on this important subject and encourage the agency to finalize its preliminary decision to create a new HCPCS code for amnioban and Guardian. Thank you. Agenda item number nine, attachment number 14.19, request to establish a new level two HCPCS code for Clarix 100. Attachment number 14.20, Request to establish a new level two HCPCS code for NEOX flow. Attachment number 14.21, request to establish a new level two HCPCS code for Clarix flow. Attachment number 14.22, request to establish a new level two HCPCS for Clarix cord 1K. And attachment number 14.23, request to establish a new level two HCPCS code for NEOX 100. Primary speaker is Aaron Smith.
thank you to uh, CNS and to the work group for this opportunity to speak with you today. So this presentation is the, uh, the subject of five different applications. Um, just for historical review, uh, in last year's uh, annual process, we had submitted one application for our Neox 1K product. Uh, at the time, that was allocated Q4148 for Neox 1K per square centimeter. Uh, for this year's cycle, we had submitted five new applications uh, requesting unique Q codes for each of those five products. The products that were the subjects of those applications are Neox 100, Clarex 100, Clarex Cord 1K, Neox Flow, and Clarex Flow. So those are five different products. Uh, the preliminary recommendations of the work group were as such. They recommended that Neox 1K, uh, I'm sorry, Neox 100 be combined with Neox 1K under Q4148, the existing code. They recommended that the Clarex products, 100 and 1K, uh, would not receive a new dedicated Q code. And they recommended that the Flow products, Neox and Clarex, would receive a new combined uh, Q code. So we had some uh, commentaries and we'd like to request some reconsideration. Um, trying to make a somewhat complicated topic simple here. Uh, I would say that the take home here is that there's a pretty well established precedent at this point for uh, products that are the same but have multiple trade names to be considered under one combined code and products that are different to have unique Q codes. And we, uh, we understand CMS's desire to uh, sort of simplify and consolidate the coding uh, spectrum. Uh, we, uh, so to start, the Neox Flow and the Clarex Flow products uh, receiving a combined code, we agree with the preliminary decision and we uh, appreciate that and you know, thank you for the consideration. What we would like to propose is that the rest of the way through the product line, we follow the same methodology and combine the 1K products, both Neox and Clarex under one code, and combine the 100 products, Neox and Clarex under one code. Those are identical products that are sold under two different brand names for, for various reasons. So uh, just to give you a little better kind of vis visual of our, our product line, our structure, say Omniox Medical is the parent company. Um, we have a Clarex umbrella brand and a Neox umbrella brand. Within those brands, there are various configurations of the product. So the ones that we'll talk most about today are the 1K family of products and the 100 family of products. The 1K products are derived from human umbilical cord. The 100 products are derived from human amniotic membrane. Um, and actually those, those uh, descriptors, the 100 and the 1K, actually correspond to the thickness of the product. The Clarex products are 100 microns in thickness because they're taken from the amniotic membrane of the placenta. The 1K products are uh, 1,000 microns or one millimeter in thickness because they're taken from the umbilical cord. So across the brands, Clarex and Neox, they're actually the same product in the package, just a different brand name for, for both the 1K and the 100. So the recommendation to combine the Neox products, Neox 1K and Neox 100 under the same code was problematic from, from a number of standpoints. Um, so, so back to the recommendations again, the flow codes we were okay with, Neox and Clarex flow going under the same new Q code, we support that and, and thank you very much. So the second recommendation we had was to split out the 100 products and the 1K products. And, and just a sort of schematic of the difference between these, so both products are taken from donated placentas. We procure these at the time of a live healthy childbirth. Um, the amniotic membrane, if you look at the, the picture here, uh, that is the inner lining of the placenta. That's effectively the, the bubble that contains the fetus. Um, you can see that it's, it's fairly large and fairly thin. It, uh, there's quite a bit of surface area. So on a per donor basis, it's a, it's a fairly abundant resource. By comparison, the umbilical cord is the cord that actually uh, connects the fetus to the placenta and, and thus the mother. Um, that cord is relatively small compared to the rest of the placenta and our 1K products are derived from that cord. So on a per donor basis, it's a much more scarce and precious resource. There's just simply uh, not as much material available to make a product from. Um, the reason we do this, however, is that that umbilical cord has a, a totally different set of uh, tissue biology and, and uh, physical form and structure. So it is a completely separate product from the 100 products and, and one that's uh, very valuable to us. So the products differ, the 1K products and the 100 products differ uh, in terms of thickness, in terms of the layers of tissue that are present. Umbilical cord is, uh, consists of different tissue layers than amniotic membrane. 
Um, in terms of clinical applications, often they'll use the thicker tissue for uh, a deeper wound. And also the price point, of course, because of the scarcity of the umbilical cord and the anatomic smallness of it, it's more expensive for us to procure and manufacture. And, and just to illustrate it, here's our 100 products and our 1K products side by side. And you can see in the microscope pictures, the 100 is very thin, the 1K is very thick. Uh, the layers of tissue that are present uh, are different with the amniotic membrane. You have an epithelial layer and a, a thin stromal layer. With the 1K product, you have amniotic membrane, of course, on the outside, but you also have this thicker layer of Wharton's jelly, which is unique to umbilical cord, not present in amniotic membrane. Um, you can also see that the dimensions of the packaged product are different due to the abundance of amniotic membrane and the relative scarcity and small size of umbilical cord. So, uh, you know, we can talk a lot about the biological differences between amniotic membrane and umbilical cord. I, I don't want to uh, bore you with the science lecture, but, um, you know, there's many things you can measure. One of the ones that we feel is more important is hyaluronic acid. This is a matrix protein that's often implicated in the function of these products and how they conduct wound healing. So, and I apologize for the, the difficulty of reading this bar graph, but if you look at the two left-hand bars on the graph, those are both our, pro uh, our products. So the first bar is the product that we would call 100. It's cryopreserved amniotic membrane. The second bar is the product that we would call cry uh, 1K, or cryopreserved umbilical cord. And you can see that on a, on a per protein basis, or as a ratio, the uh, umbilical cord has 10 times more hyaluronic acid. And there's a number of other things you can measure too, and you'll see the similar uh, ratios. So it is a very different product, and it would be very difficult to lump umbilical cord products in with amniotic membrane products for us from an accuracy and a, a payment standpoint. So um, back to the precedents, I think it's fairly well established here that there's, uh, there are existing Q codes from previous cycles and Q codes that are being recommended in this cycle that are identical products marketed under different brand names, uh, as is the case with ours. Um, the, the top two uh, on this chart are in this year's cycle. There's preliminary codes recommended for the Allowrap products, uh, wet and dry, and for Amnioban and Guardian, which are uh, supposedly identical products under different, different brand names. Um, the bottom one is from last year's cycle, the FlexPatch HD and Allopatch HD, uh, which were uh, similar products under different brand names. Um, it's also notable that a lot of these products are um, cover the use both surgically and uh, from a wound care standpoint. And we know that's been a, an area of contention in the past. So uh, we're, we're just trying to kind of respect the current precedents that have been established by CMS and propose that we continue to follow them. So what we recommend from a coding standpoint then is, is basically three codes that are consolidated by product uh, type. So the, the flow products that we had already discussed that the recommended new code, we abide by that. The existing code for Q4148, what we would propose is that rather than combine that with Neox 100, which is a whole different product, we simply combine that with Clarex 1K, which is the same product under, under a different brand name. And there would be one additional Q code for the 100 products, both Clarex and Neox. So I apologize, there's a lot of names being thrown around, but we feel that's the, the most simplified structure that we can come to to uh, meet both your needs and ours. So in summary, the key differentiators between these products are really the source material and the procurement cost, uh, that, and the number of layers and the thickness and what actually makes the product up. Uh, the key distinction for us is umbilical cord in one category, uh, placental amniotic membrane in the other category. The preliminary decisions didn't uh, really recognize the difference in the product type, only the brand name. Um, so the Neox and Clarex products are really indistinct from one another, despite the different brand names. Um, you know, we, we use those different brand names for a number of business purposes, not really for external policy reasons. And for accuracy, what we request is that we have dedicated codes for our umbilical cord products, for our amniotic membrane products, and for our particulate products. And uh, with that, uh, thank you for your time. Okay, there are no five-minute speakers for item number nine. Do we have any questions? Yes, please. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much for your talk. Just out of curiosity, because I don't have your applications in front of me, all I have is your um, stuff you gave us. 
What's the diff if it's the same product, what's the difference between Neox and Clarix? Why do you give it different names? Is it used differently or in different places or we, we, why, do, why different names? Yeah, as a generality, we tend to use uh, Neox products more for topical wound applications and Clarix products more for uh, barrier functions. There is a, it's not a truly black and white thing here. As you see with a lot of these wounds, they tend to extend into tendon and bone and some of those areas. A lot of it is just for internal tracking for us. We, we have different uh, sales outlets that conduct the, their business in different ways, and we can track the activity of those by using different brand names. Thanks. Sure. Thank you. Next is agenda item number 10. Um, for agenda item number 10 and 11, we have the same primary speaker. So we are aware that there are five minute speakers that have registered for agenda item number 10. We would like to ask that you would wait and hold off with your presentations until after Mr. Rudolph has gone through both agendas items 10 and 11. Agenda item number 10 is attachment number 14.10 and it's a request to establish four new level two HCPCS codes for use to categorize all skin substitute products except Aplograph, Fortiderm, and Fortiderm antimicrobial. Okay. Agenda item number 11 is attachment number 14.11, and it is a request to establish a new level two HCPCS code for Fortiderm antimicrobial PHMB, and attachment number 14.12, which is a request to establish a new level two HCPCS code for Fortiderm. And your primary speaker is Dr. Paul Rudolph. Take Thank it away. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, one small correction, the uh, item number 10 to create uh, four new uh, skin substitute categories, it would replace the Fortiderm codes. It was not meant to be, the Fortiderm was not meant to be in addition to that. They were two completely uh, separate proposals. So thank you very much. Uh, the, the, this, the, my presentation, which is one presentation, by the way, for both, uh, both items, is a little bit different than, than most of them. I've been coming to these meetings now for the last, uh, I think, eight years and noticed the proliferation of codes over the last seven or eight years. And uh, my client, Organogenesis, who I'm representing today, felt that it was really time for the stakeholders to consider alternative approaches or at least be able to, to, to have a discussion about what the best approach to coding for skin substitutes really is. I think most people will recall that in the early part of this century, there were four or five codes that, were, that described skin substitutes that went by uh, biologically active, inactive, uh, bioengineered, not bioengineered, and uh, there was a long process, and, and Cindy and her team were very involved with that, and the decision was made a number of years ago to give product-specific uh, codes because folks couldn't agree on what was bioengineered and what wasn't, what was living and what wasn't, and it was, it was, it was a, a very interesting discussion, and that was the, the decision that was made. I think that the reason I'm here today is to is to have the group think about what the best way to go forward is. We've seen a huge proliferation in codes. I think today we've heard from a number of folks that there are identical products marketed under uh, different names. We have products that are used in surgical uses as well as skin uses. We have products that are two layers, three layers, four layers, eight layers. We've got a, a million variations of things and I think it's very confusing to a lot of people. I, I wouldn't be surprised if it was confusing to CMS. I, I, uh, it's hard for me reading the, the website to know if any of these products are really different or not. And I, I think it's really time that we have a, a really intelligent, thoughtful discussion about how to go forward. And that's why I'm up here today. And I hope that, that I'm looking forward to hearing what all the presenters have to say. There's one added thing that, uh, that has come up this year, and I know we're not supposed to talk about payment, but the reality is, is that there is a new bundling policy for skin substitutes in the outpatient prospective payment system. And most folks in here know that the outpatient hospital is the main market for these products. There is physician office use, I think, for most of them, but the main use is in the, in the, in the outpatient hospital. And if products have to use a non-specific code, they are now assigned to the low bundle. It's, that's my understanding of reading the rule, is that if you don't have a code, you, your, your ASP isn't going to be tracked, or at least no matter what your ASP is, you're going to be in the low bundle. If you have a code, 
then you have an opportunity to be tracked and you can go into either bundle. Now, I'm not going to get into the pass-through issues, but because any, anybody can apply for a pass-through and get a C code, but there's clearly now a market issue with regard to coding, and I hope that the HICPIX workgroup works closely with the payment group to understand the implications of some of these decisions. And uh, this, this slide discusses that um, a little bit more. And I think the bottom line for, for my client is that the HICPIX workgroup should not inadvertently create market advantages or disadvantages for any product. The product should be able to compete in the marketplace without the coding affecting them. And this is just a slide showing uh, uh, the proliferation in applications and codes. I think there were 12 new codes granted last year. This year, I, I, there's, there's 15 applications and I think 29 different products that were the subject of those applications. And my guess is, given the way the bundles are working, there will probably be another 30 applications next year. I wouldn't be surprised. And I, it was amusing when Cindy said at the beginning this morning that who would have ever dreamed that we'd be having a whole day on skin substitutes and it maybe will be happening every year for a while now. Uh, I do, and because of what I just said before, I greatly appreciate the fact that the, the work group has a really difficult problem in front of it in evaluating all these applications because of what I said before about the naming and the uses and, and are these products really different or not. Uh, the, one, the one point I want to make on this slide, though, is that in most other areas, CMS does have cat coding codes that are described categories of products and not individual products. It was a big step to go the individual route the way this the work group did several years ago. And I, what I'm up here to, to, to say is, is it time to rethink that? I, I don't know for sure, but I think it's something that we need to consider because it is a departure and it's set up a number of issues for the work group that are really difficult to resolve. And I can just, having been here years ago myself, I can just imagine the man hours that it's taking to go through all these applications and figure out what's what. Uh, this, this is just a, a, a slide talking about human tissue products and 510Ks. You've heard a lot about that already. I'm not going to belabor it anymore. I will, uh, the second bullet though, for the preliminary decisions this year, and I'm going to show a couple of tables in a second, uh, CMS looks to me has made three different decisions for products that are very similar. Uh, in some cases, a product gets as recommended as, as an A code is available. In other cases, there's no programmatic need. In the third case, a new code is, uh, is, is, is recommended. In the fourth case, a new, uh, an old code is revised, looking to me for, like the, the re different rec disparate recommendations for very similar products. And here's a table showing uh, we try to divide them into placenta and amniotic uh, membranes, but here's a table with what I believe all of the amniotic membrane products that were, that were applied for codes this year. And you can see the coding recommendations on the right. We have the uses here. And I would, I would point out, uh, and again, I, I, I don't want anybody to construe anything that I'm saying about another product. I'm not up here to make any comments about the worth or value of, of another product. This is strictly going by what was on the website and my attempt to sort of figure out what was going on. If you look at, uh, at, at BioVance and um, uh, Clarix Flow, uh, the, it looked to me like the indications were identical from what was on the website, uh, yet, and, and also the, the, the source looked pretty identical to me or very similar, yet BioVance was not recommended, uh, was recommended to use an A code, and Clarix Flow got recommended for a new code. Uh, and again, I don't want to belabor this. Everybody, I think everybody who represents a product is here. You all know your own products better than I do. I think most folks came up here today saying that products similarly situated to me have a code, therefore I deserve a code also. And I think this table just points out in a, in a, in a very visual way that there's really something going on here that doesn't appear, at least for these preliminary recommendations, to be consistent. And I'll be happy to go through this in more detail if someone wants, wants to ask me a question about it. And the same thing's true with the placental products. Uh, there's only one cadaver product that was up, uh, up this year. And then when you look at the 510K products, uh, uh, the, the, most of these have already been presented, you'll see something similar in that a couple of them were recommended to have codes uh, and others weren't. Now, with respect to Fortiderm and Fortiderm antimicrobial, I think it's very important for the 510K products to look at their predicates. And uh, I've, I've met with, with Cindy and, and the group here before. My, my firm actually analyzed every single predicate all the way back to the beginning for every 510K product. And uh, it, 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 there's some very interesting information comes out if you look back 
all, at all the predicates, because you've got to go back 10, 12 years and look at 12 or 13 different predicates. The one thing that stands out here is that SIS wound dressing, which is now known as OASIS, Q4102, that was the predicate for Fortiderm. Uh, Fortiderm is different than OASIS, though. It's a predicate, but it's not identical. Fortiderm has a different purification mechanism. There's less cellular debris. There's a higher tensile strength. There's more purified collagen. So it is, it is different than, than OASIS. But the interesting thing is, from, from, from organogenesis point of view, is OASIS has a code. OASIS was the predicate for Fortiderm. So we don't understand why Fortiderm shouldn't get a code also. Uh, I know that there's this, we get asked questions about is there hospital use, is there office use? Well, these products are all used in both, in, both, uh, uh, in both locations, and they should be available in both locations with their own codes if the group wants to go, if the work group wants to go in the direction of having codes for every single product. And we put Helicol here in the middle also to show that they have the similar predicates to, uh, to us, and yet they were recommended to have an A code. So we had, a we, we had a recommendation, there's no programmatic need. Helicol had a, had a recommendation to use an A code, yet these products all have the same predicates. Now, one of, one of the, so I, I think that, the, I hope the work group will think about that, and fo other folks may have comments on, on that later on. This is another example, and I th I'm not going to belabor what the gentleman just said here, but again, we had the Neox and Clarix up here as another slide showing uh, uh, the, the different recommendations. So... At, at the end of the day, we're very concerned about what appears to be a lack of consistency and a great deal of difficulty figuring out what differences between products justify a new code and what differences don't justify a code. And the third category could be what differences justify revising a code. And of course, the payment issues aside with ASP and all of that, I think that's a whole other issue that plays into this. But I don't know, and I, I worked here for a number of years, I don't know, and I know a fair amount about this space, I don't know that I'm smart enough to figure this out, and I know that the folks here have a lot of other things to do, and they, they, they're way smarter than me, but I think this is a really difficult problem, and I don't know that it's going to be solved. And so we have two choices that we wanted to put before the work group and open up for discussion today. One is to go in the direction of categories, and we certainly realize that our category proposal is not the only one. There could be eight other ways to skin the cat. But we thought we should put something on the table to discuss this because the other option in our view is since it's so hard to figure out what differences matter and what differences don't is that every product should get a code. Either way, it would seem to us that there's a level playing field. If you go the other way and every product gets a code, we will at some point have three or 400 codes, which may be fine. It may not be fine. But, but I think we need to make a conscious decision about which way to go. This was our proposal. Uh, as I said, it's, it's self-explanatory. We realize there are other ways to, to, to skin this cat, depending on how granular you want to get with human versus non-human and equine versus bovine and, and you know, uh, placental versus amniotic versus cadaver and all that kind of stuff. And, and I understand that this proposal is, is unlikely to be adopted by the work group for 2015, but I think it's important that we really consider whether that might not be a better way to go rather than try and figure out whether something that has seven layers versus five layers is a meaningful distinction that justifies a new code. Uh, and I, I guess I'll, I'll, just, I'll just end with, with one more thing about Fortiderm and Fortiderm antimicrobial is that at least in the 510K space, especially given the bundling, if the work group believes that some 510K products are worthy of having a code, then at least in that space, it seems like every product should be worthy of having a code because they all have the same predicates. They're all directly competing in the marketplace for the same types of wounds. They all have the, by the same, mostly the same instructions for use that the FDA mandates. These don't have labels like drugs. They have instructions for use. So, uh, so I'll end with that about Fortiderm and Fortiderm antimicrobial and I'll wait to hear what the other speakers have to say. All right, at this time, I would like to call our first five-minute speaker, Marsha Nuscart.
Good morning. I'm Marcia Nusgaard. I'm the Executive Director of the Alliance of Wound Care Stakeholders. And many of you know that this is the umbrella group of clinical associations whose members you know, treat patients with wounds. The Alliance is a membership organization and receives membership dues from the clinical associations, non-clinical associations, and business entities. Uh, the Alliance strongly agrees with the preliminary coding decision in which CMS suggested not to establish four new HCPCS codes or to categorize these skin substitute products among the suggested four new A codes, which would be classified as dressings. And we ha really have two reasons you know, for this. One is that the skin substitutes or as we uh, call it, uh, which is a little bit more clinically appropriate, cellular and or tissue-based products for wounds, otherwise known as CTPs, they're not surgical or wound dressings in the way they function, their clinical indications, or their technology. Second of all, and it's also because of the linkage, as, as Mr. Rudolph had, or Dr. Rudolph had mentioned, that there is some linkage to the payment aspects of it and the fact that CTPs are tied to a different payment method than surgical dressings. They're separately payable by their average sales price of a given product so that CMS is able to identify them and track them as a set packaging rates. So to the first point, a surgical dressing or wound care dressing that is utilized for covering and protecting a wound and helps shield the wound against the environment without exerting any direct biological effect. CTPs are products that contain viable or non-viable cells and are derived from biological tissues with intrinsic biological activities and usually not removed from the wound and are uniquely utilized for their biological influence or, the healing process, or on the healing process, whether they have a positive influence on the healing process without incorporation or have the ability to stabilize or support healing through incorporation in whole or part into the regenerating tissue. Now, what's interesting is even in the 2013 hospital outpatient PPS final rule regulation, CMS did state that since skin substitutes are a class of products that we treat as biological. The term quote unquote skin substitutes refer to a category of products that are most commonly used in outpatient settings for the treatment of diabetic foot ulcers and venous stasis ulcers. Although the term skin substitute has been adopted to refer to this category of products in certain contexts, these products do not actually function like human skin that's grafted onto the wound. They are not a substitute for skin graft. Instead, these products are applied to wounds to aid wound healing, and through various me uh, mechanisms of action, they stimulate the host to regenerate lost tissue. Furthermore, CMS states, we acknowledge that there's differences in composition among the various skin substitute products, and that is why each is assigned a distinct uh, HCPCS Q code or HCPCS C code in some cases. If all the products were identical, we would only need one code to describe all of them. Skin substitutes are those products that are used in wound healing procedures, and that is typically assigned a HCPCS Q code in the 4100 series. But to the second point on the payment side of things, while CMS established individual Q codes for these products, there are several additional important reasons to have product-specific codes assigned to them, at least at this point in time. CMS determines the pricing for these biological products based on the average sales price methodology. And Section 1848A of the Social Security Act states that a manufacturer is required to provide the unit of measure for their specific product along with the average sales price for their products. Furthermore, the Care Claims Processing Manual in Chapter 17 further elaborates that the payment limit for a biological product will be based on the price and information for products marketed or sold under the applicable FDA approval. As appropriate, a unique HCPCS HIC code will be assigned to facilitate separate payment. Finally, a facility is required to utilize HCPCS codes on their claim forms to identify all services and products used in a procedure. Since these products, as CMS has stated in their own regulations, have different mechanisms of action, they need to be identified in the claims forms uniquely by their own individual uh, HCPCS Q code. As many of you know, uh, that the Alliance of Wound Care Stakeholders came to CMS, and we had roughly about 25 or 30 uh, CMS staff uh, at a meeting where we brought in FDA attorneys as well as clinicians to be able to talk about uh, these particular products and maybe there needs time and we'd love to be able to serve as a resource again to be able to come to you because clearly there needs to be a discussion and, and I agree 
with what, what you said, Paul, in terms of trying to figure out, you know, is there a bright line on how the CMS Hicks Picks work group does establish where, where there's something's a collagen dressing, something is actually a, uh, a skin, skin substitute or CTP. We're happy to serve as a resource for that. That's what we're here for, to be able to help you in this regard. Thank you so much. All right, at this time, we're gonna call for our second five-minute speaker, Ms. Karen Ravitz. Thank you. Uh, my name is Karen Ravitz. I am the Senior Policy Advisor for the Coalition of Wound Care Manufacturers. And the coalition represents leading manufacturers in wound care. Uh, they manufacture products in wound care. Uh, on behalf of the coalition, I just wanted to thank the panel. I know this has been a very difficult task, uh, but uh, we wanted to thank you for maintaining the preliminary coding decision to uh, have individual HCPCS codes for the cellular and or tissue-based product for wounds, the CTPs, referred to as skin substitutes uh, during this meeting. We strongly agree with the decision not to grant nonspecific HCPCS A codes uh, to CTP products as they do not have the same mechanisms of actions as surgical dressings. So again, we thank you very much for your decision. Sir, I see that you have a question. If we could just get through our other five-minute speakers, we'll call for questions. Thank you. Okay, our third five-minute speaker is Kathleen Shaw. Yes, good morning. My name is Kathleen Shaw, and I'm the Director of Medical Products Reimbursement for Smith & Nephew Biotherapeutics. On, half of, excuse me, on behalf of Smith & Nephew Biotherapeutics, which markets Oasis Wound Matrix and Oasis Ultra Trilayer Matrix, I am pleased to provide these comments in support of the work group's um, preliminary, excuse me, preliminary decision uh, not to create the A codes for these products. Uh, and we agree with that, and we have three reasons. The first is the requester is seeking new non-specific codes to replace product-specific codes in the Q4100 series that currently are used to report skin substitute products insofar as coverage policies often turn on the evidence supporting individual products such as the availability of a USP monograph and or published peer review studies showing the safety and effectiveness of specific products. It would be difficult for the Medicare administrative contractors and other payers to distinguish among those products without the granularity afforded by the current codes. The second reason is insofar as skin substitute substitute products have USP monographs and are covered as biologics under Medicare, payment is set by statute as 106% of the ASP for the specific biologic products. The granularity of the current code is necessary to allow for the reporting and payment as required under the Social Security Act 1847A. Even in the hospital outpatient setting where these products are packaged, CMS has recognized the need for product-specific codes to be reported so that CMS can determine whether the packaged payment for the product and facility fee should be assigned to the high versus the lower cost product APC. This would not be possible if product-specific codes were withdrawn in favor of non-specific codes distinguished by tissue origin. And the third reason is it is unclear why the requester believes Applegraph, Fortiderm, and Fortiderm antimicrobial would not fit under their proposed scheme of four non-specific codes. If there were no need for product-specific codes for the overwhelming majority of skin substitute products, and we believe there is a need, then it would appear that the three specific products identified by the requester likewise should be included under those codes. And the last thing I'd like to speak about is the process. 
Um, if we really were going to do this, uh, it seems as if the community at large would not have an opportunity to comment on this particular process. Stakeholders who, write, who rely on the current product-specific Q codes would have little notice that the established codes were being replaced by the proposed non-specific codes. There is no reason to assume that stakeholders would review the detailed background discussion section for every item on the two-day agenda for drugs and biologics in order to identify that a requester had proposed new codes to replace the established codes. Without adequate notice, CMS will not receive sufficient comment on the proposal, and CMS cannot replace a significant series of established product-specific codes with non-specific codes without adequate notice and sufficient comment from stakeholder comments. Moreover, insofar as the payment rates under Medicare Part B for skin substitutes furnished in office or non-hospital settings would be established under the new codes, um, it would be very, very difficult then for the physicians and the physician offices to properly report these products uh, and be paid un under the ASP. And such a change in payment policy, we believe, would be impermissible under Section 1847A and we re would require further comment and notice. And therefore, we thank you and I agree with your recommendation. Our next five-minute speaker is Deborah Dean. Hello, my name is Deborah Dean. I'm with Memetics. We have a product called Epifix and Amiofix. Um, I want to come here today and strongly agree with the preliminary decision that was given by the committee and thank them for that. I agree with a lot of the prior comments by um, Smith and Nephew. Um, the, it seems somewhat disingenuous that you would like to create codes for everyone except Applegraph and Dermograph, which you acquired in January, and not put those in the series of categories that you were proposing altruistically. Um, the, the code sets, I think they're established as that they have codes, they have a purpose, and actually I would argue that the codes have been uh, brought together in the packaging bundling effort through the coverage and payment. We're all treated equally. We all can compete um, with the physicians choosing which products work better for their patients. And I think that's where it should be in, is in the hands of the physicians to make the choices for the products that work the best. And, you know, I think that uh, another key point is that they have, for example, for Epifix, in 2011, there are approximately 1,200 units of our products um, distributed. In 2013, there were 24,000 distributed, and this year there's going to be tw between 40 and 50,000 units of our products distributed. So I think the physicians do choose, and that the methodology actually in place supports that. We have over 200 patients in peer-reviewed studies, as they were talking about the studies, I think that is an indicator of the clinical efficacy of the product. And honestly, I think one of the reasons that CMS made the decision that they did for the packaging and bundling effort is because there was a lot of wastage in, in the system. There was per square centimeter charges. There were products that had 38 and 44 square centimeter products with the average DFU, the median DFU in the JAMA study at 1.32. Um, and so a lot of it was thrown away and taxpayer dollars were wasted. I think it's a lot more um, advantageous for Medicare and for the taxpayers to pay for size appropriate graphs. And um, I think a lot of the products that are coming onto the market now, um, including ours, support that. And it allows a physician to choose an efficacious product, a size appropriate product, and pay appropriately. And additionally, I think this is another way that you're trying to um, circumvent the payment policy that was published last year. You um, sued CMS. That uh, lawsuit was dismissed because of the same methodology that you wanted PMA products to be treated separately. We would argue that um, the products need their Q codes. They need to follow the payment methodology that um, has been prescribed and that we believe that uh, the preliminary decision uh, was a correct one and we're here to support that. Thank you.
Our next five-minute speaker is Andrew Ruskin. Uh, thank you, Ms. Eggleston, and uh, thank you, Hickpix Committee. I appreciate the opportunity here uh, to present uh, to you today. Uh, so my name is Andy Ruskin, and I uh, am with the law firm of Morgan Lewis, and I am representing Mimetics, and so I'm uh, uh, with Ms. Dean here today to follow up with some of the uh, legal uh, underpinnings of some of what she has uh, just presented to you. So uh, I, just as a starting point, uh, I, whereas I very much appreciate Dr. Rudolph's comments regarding transparency, it's hard to disagree with transparency. We all think transparency is a good thing. That being said, the application that was submitted does not talk about transparency. The application was very much a bid to get declassified or classified as supplies all of the competitor products uh, to the organogenesis products. And so unless Dr. Rudolph is prepared today to say uh, that was just a joke and we're actually retracting that application, we really do have to work with the application that's in front of you all. And that application was nothing other than a bid uh, to, to uh, gain a competitive advantage by creating a disadvantage for all of the other products in the space. Uh, so I think actually from the get-go, it would have been, you all would have been on very solid legal footing if you had simply said, this is outside of our mandate and just dismissed it as opposed to even having given it a preliminary decision. That being said, you certainly understood what the programmatic purposes were for all of the supply, uh, all of the, 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 uh, the codes that are currently there for all the wound care products and not, not giving them a supply code instead. And so I, I very much applaud your efforts for digging into it and, and figuring out what is appropriate under the circumstances. So let me just talk about Epifix, which is the Mimetics product, for just a second as a, um, an example of, of what is out there. So Epifix is a product that has been uh, approved for citation uh, in the United States Pharmacopeia, and as a result, under the statute, as I believe the Smith and Nephew uh, representative pointed out, it is entitled to, uh, uh, to be reimbursed under average sales price plus 6% under the physician fee schedule. That is the programmatic purpose. Uh, and so that is why, although there may very, very well be confusion, and yes, you all may very well be struggling with some of the difficult issues about how to, to group products that do qualify as, uh, as uh, skin substitutes versus those that are truly supplies, that's a decision you all are making, but there is a programmatic purpose uh, for why there are, subs there are separate codes for a lot of these products. Uh, so, that is, so that is the benchmark, and that is, of course, what you all con convene every year to discuss. Uh, so Epifix, as I said, is uh, approved by the United States Pharmacopeia, is approved for inclusion, uh, and CMS gave it a C code uh, on the basis of it viewing it as a biological, so yet another programmatic purpose. Uh, and it is reimbursed under the physician fee schedule as a biological. Uh, so at least with respect to Epifix, we do appreciate that there is uh, a reason why it doesn't have an A code, it has a Q code. Uh, so going back to a point that a couple of people have made, there are now additional programmatic purposes. CMS has walked a very fine balance between trying to come up with a cost containment strategy whereby uh, there, is, uh, there is competition among the skin substitute products, and yet at the same time, hospitals are not going to be expected to, to lump everyone together. There is the high cost and the low cost uh, uh, AP, uh, uh, payment, payment groupings for a good reason. There are differences in those products, and CMS had the ability uh, to put everyone into one bucket, and they said, no, we think that there are legitimate reasons for why hospitals should get paid more, but we're not going to completely uh, uh, give you a free pass. We're going to bundle everything together. There's still competition, and hospitals are, however, not expected to completely take it on the chin. So that was a decision that CMS made. Clearly, there's a programmatic purpose, therefore, for continuing to, sub to have uh, separate codes for all the skin substitute products. Now, um, as a couple of speakers have mentioned, the idea that uh, the FDA treatment is going to somehow govern whether or not a product qualifies is an idea that CMS has, has looked at and has roundly dismissed. CMS uh, had received comments from Organogenesis, which uh, we have submitted uh, as part of our, uh, our comments to you, where they very clearly say, we think we're different because we're a PMA product. And CMS said, clinical and resource homogeneity, that is our mantra. 
and, if, and we don't care about the FDA treatment. And so it's good for competition, it's good for the patients, and so we ask you not to, to give any more credence than CMS did because, again, it is CMS's programmatic purpose which you are supposed to be honoring. So, uh, and with that, I, I thank you very much for the opportunity to, to, to discuss this with you today. All right, our next five minute speaker is Shanna Christop. Good morning. My name is Shanna Christop, and I'm here representing the American Association of Tissue Banks. Just wanted to make sure that you know that AATB strongly supports CMS's uh, initial. Uh, interpretation regarding the termination of HISPIS codes based on clinical similarity and not FDA approval pathway. Um, we, if you do decide to go and completely revamp your HISPIS codes and think about this in, in a more uh, broader picture as suggested, I hope you'll take adequate steps and provide lots of notice and comment and we're happy to be a partner and work with you on dealing with that since we do represent all the tissue banks including the applicant that submitted this original application. Thank you. All right, our last five minute speaker for this item, Heather Brennan. Good morning, uh, my name is Heather Brennan. I'm a, a, a PhD with a focus in regenerative medicine and uh, tissue engineering and I currently serve as the director of new product development for Derma Sciences. Uh, first we wanna thank the centers for Medicare and Medicaid services, particularly the HICPEX work group for allowing comments to the preliminary decisions here today. Um, we, we agree with much of the comments that were made already uh, via the, prelim the previous five minute speakers. We commend the CMS HICPEX work group for your pre preliminary decision to maintain individual HICPEX codes for skin substitute products. Uh, we've talked today about agenda item number 10, attachment uh, 14.010 requested four interchangeable HICPEX codes to be established for skin substitutes based upon FDA regulatory status. We commend your decision to maintain established individual codes for these products, each of which is distinguished by tissue source and proprietary processing or manufacturing methods. These products represent data supported advanced healing options for Medicare beneficiaries. So thank you for the opportunity to provide comments. We strongly encourage CMS to maintain its initial decision, decision not to grant non-specific interchangeable HICPEX codes. Thank you. All right, at this time, we'll take any questions. Guna from MCOM. Uh, it was a very nice presentation, Dr. Rudolph. You know, it, you know, I enjoyed every bit of the um, talk. Uh, but I have uh, some comments and also there were some misleading or incorrect uh, information about Helicol. Uh, basically, if you happen to compare, the Helical 510K originally was comparing 6 cis 2 um, um, uh, matrix, which was uh, already had been changed to OASIS, and the same way, you know, as of 2013, our company has already went through the process of having the product upgraded as a skin substitute uh, or, or as a um, bioengineered <coughs> skin substitute. Accordingly, you know, I mean, uh, the um, correction you may have to make in your presentation that Helicol is not just a, a, a wound dressing. And that concept, again, I want the uh, HICPIX work group committee to uh, take into consideration very carefully and based on the effectiveness, which has been already supported by most of your uh, five minute speakers also to make sure the committee uh, understands and sees you know, what is the benefits to the end users. If a product like a Helicol, which is, has the ability to get the incorporation of new tissue within five, five days, you know, why don't that be granted as the uh, better product than the other products? Thank you. Thanks. Well, I want to thank all the speakers for exactly making my point. I think every single speaker that came up here agreed with everything that I said. It's just a matter of the route that, that they want the work group to take. Everything you said. But, but no, but I, I made the point that there's one of two ways that's, that CMS can go. And, and frankly, CMS itself was recommending the A code for some of these. Uh, 
I, I think that it's irrelevant what our proposal was, A, Q, whatever it is. But the fact is, is that if CMS believes that these products all are different, then every one of them should have their own code. And I don't see any basis then for saying that some products are supplies and A codes, as CMS preliminarily recommended, that there's no programmatic need for others when the products all do the same thing, they all compete in the marketplace against each other, and doctors should have a choice to, as, as to what's available and what they should do and should be able to have a reporting code for it. Uh, I think all the payment issues are irrelevant for this conversation, really. Uh, I think that the issue of ASP and whether you need a code or not is something beyond, beyond you on the group, but as far as coding itself goes, I think that everyone's in agreement that CMS has to have a level playing field and has to be fair to all of, all of the products and characterize them all similarly. And I, I think that to me that point was made loud and clear by everybody. So, Dr. Rudolph, then are you suggesting that uh, that there should be no special treatment then for Aplograph, Dermagraft, or any of the other products that are Organogenesis as? Especially in light of the fact that in litigation, you, 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 uh, your company tried to establish the opposite and was told by court uh, that there's no statutory basis for a separate treatment. Well, I, I don't think the litigation is really relevant to this, and I don't think we're asking for any special treatment for anything. Um, and I, I, don't, I don't think it's that, that anyone's interested in having a debate between manufacturers. I think we're in, in, a, in a, it's a coding issue. If people would like to engage me in a debate over the merits of the lawsuit and a debate over different products, we, we can do that outside. Yeah, I'm just, but it's relevant here because it's all about programmatic need, and what the statute says is relevant for programmatic need. Would you agree? The lawsuit had nothing to do with anything we're talking about today. I'm not understanding how it's relevant. Uh, there was a, a, an attempt to create a distinction be some, between some products versus other products based upon the statute. The, the, I, I mean, I don't, I don't, if you, I mean, if you want me to, I can, there's nothing, it, to, the, the, the statute just, was based on something called a specified covered outpatient drug, which has nothing to do with anything we're talking about. A specified covered outpatient drug is a statutory definition of certain products that existed from the years 2000 to 2003 and had passed through payments and that it had nothing to do with any of the products we're talking about here. So, there's nothing to do with this. So just cutting to the chase, either based upon statute, coding a policy, or what have you, would you agree that there is no distinction between Aplograph, Dermograph, and any of the other products, at least from a, from the coding policy perspective? No, I wouldn't agree with that. I think all, everyone's been saying every one of these products is different from each other. You, from, you, but in terms of whether it merits a separate code or not? Um, I don't think we should. Let's not put Paul on the spot. This is a tough conversation, and Paul, I, th I thank you for kind of kind of bringing it to us. But, but so, I, in my mind, the 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 discussion should be generally around: Do we categorize, or do we um, just code absolutely everything? Is that okay with you? I don't want to put Paul on the spot, or or make him or any of any of you feel uncomfortable or like you would have to defend yourselves or your individual position um, ever because I want this to be a really healthy conversation. This has been a thorn in our, in our side, as, as you can see, with the proliferation of codes. And, and um, so uh, we want to thank everybody for so strongly agreeing with us, but we're, we're not sure we love, love the way this has all turned out either. So, so just keep going, but, but keep the conversation sort of healthy. And any, any additional comments about lumping versus separate codes for everything, I would really love to hear. Um, Paul, you mentioned that ASP is irrelevant. And we've heard from other speakers that ASP is the whole point. So, so um, if we could have more discussion ar around well, that. And I also um, heard the... Uh, that that HICPIX coding, the level two HICPIX coding, impacts the the ops, the HOPPS pricing in, ber in terms of the high and low. Is is that is it well, really? Well, well the, ma the main way that it that the main way that it uh, it affects pricing in the bundles is that if you have to use an unspecified code, you get automatically assigned to the low cost bundle. So theoretically, what would happen is a product. That, that, that doesn't get a, a, a HICPICS code will have to use an unspecified code because I'm gathering that most of the, 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 the manufacturers here would not agree that the A code that is available really describes the product. So they'll use the unspecified Q code uh, and they will 
uh, and then they'll be assigned to the low bundle. Now, I suppose it's true that they could try and get a C code and maybe get a pass through for a couple of years, even though but then after that they'd be stuck in the low bundle again. So I think there is, there is that definite payment implication. As far as ASP goes, I think you could have, with every lawyer in the room could have a different opinion about whether you actually need to have a code to be paid under ASP. I mean, there's, there are a lot of products out there that meet the definition of drug and biologics that don't have codes and they still get paid under ASP. So I personally don't know that I agree with what was said about that. However, I think that, that the, the point is, is that there are, there are payment implications, and if CMS takes the, another position that you do need to have a code, then every one of these products should have its own code. I mean, you shouldn't be lumping in four different products into, into one code, because they all could have different ASPs. Um, so I think that's, a, that's an issue you need to take up with your own general counsel, uh, your own payment group as to whether or not you, what, what you believe about coding an ASP. I, I, again, I've always heard it's irrelevant to talk about all that stuff at this meeting, so I didn't really want to bring it up. Except just, for the bundling issue. I just wanted to offer a comment. I'm John McInnes. I'm the director of the Division of Outpatient Care, and we do the OPPS payment policy. With respect to uh, the HCPCS codes and how they're used uh, in the OPPS payment, I think that it's certainly true that uh, for physician fee schedule payment, they have lex less flexibility based on how that payment system is structured. In the OPPS, we have significantly more flexibility to deal with uh, various coding options and to crosswalk. So I, I don't, <clears throat> I'm not suggesting that any of the speakers, what they've said is not um, accurate based on the 2014 final rule or how we employ codes currently with the OPPS payment policy, but I do want to make the point that we have uh, a significant amount of flexibility to do crosswalks and really to work with um, any type of coding scheme that the, that the work group thinks would be favorable not just for, for CMS and Medicare, but uh, for all payers, so I offer that. Before we completely leave this, I have a question about Fortiderm. Can I ask that now? Yes. Um, what's the place of service for Fortiderm? It appears to be pretty much facility-based. Is it used outside the facility? I think it is. I, honest, I honestly don't know. I think it's sold in both sites of service. I mean, the, 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 the reason why, to me, the only issue about payment that's important here is that I, I think most folks would agree that for wound care, the vast, vast majority of the market is outpatient hospital. There's some inpatient. So yeah, I mean, I think all these products are sold a little bit in the physician office, but the, the vast majority of it is an, is an outpatient hospital, and now there is a very specific reason and why having a code is important because of the whole bundling thing that John was just talking about. But uh, I think, I don't know what we put, do you, uh, you have the application, do we, what do we put for physician office, five or 10 percent? I don't, I don't remember what we put in there. What? Oh. So I, I, can't, I wish I could give you a more specific number, I, I, but I, it's probably the same as most of the others. I can, I can leave now. <laughs> Thank everyone for that, um, that conversation. And, and maybe someday we'll get to have an even longer conversation. Will our five minute speakers please, um, if you, like I think most if not all of you had a little paper that you were talking from, would you be willing to let me have that and give me your contact information? I mean, who knows where a discussion could go in the future and I'd like to know who our contacts are. And, and um, I'm guessing that the people who spoke here today are the, the you know, people who were chosen to represent the industry kind of nationally. Thank you. Okay. On to our next agenda item, which is agenda item number 12. Attachments number 14.25. Request to establish a new level two HCPCS code to identify a human tissue allograft. Trade name Revitalon and attachment number 14.26, request to establish a new level two HCPCS code to identify a piscine dermis extracellular xenograft. Trade name Alpha Flex with Merogen Omega-3. Primary speaker is Paul Kim.
Good morning. Uh, it's still morning. Um, my name is Paul Kim. Um, I'm with the law firm of Ober Killer here in Baltimore. And just like the other Paul, I used to work here uh, as well. In fact, Incident 2 billing was the last policy that I handled and worked for. Um, but um, I, I do have slightly different views uh, on, on these issues as the previous Paul. Um, today, we'll be presenting some additional information only on the second attachment, not on the first attachment. So, if you look at the, 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 the products that are currently assigned ACOs, we see some uh, very general product categories. And uh, the Alliance has also recognized uh, these categories. For the ACOs, we see products that are synthetic, uh, biosynthetic, or animal-based biosynthetic. And there are several examples of dressings, A-coded dressings, um, that have received uh, A-codes and are, have been listed under the A-code category. Oops. If you look at the products that currently have Q-codes, we also see broad categories describing those wound care products. Animal tissue-based acellular products, human tissue-based, human, uh, viable human cells, substrates, okay? And you have examples here that currently have Q codes, OASIS uh, being one of the primary ones. So what are the differences, okay? As noted earlier, under the FDA, uh, device class, they're all unclassified, both A and Q-coded products, okay? Furthermore, under the FDA, under product classification name, they're all listed under collagen wound dressings, okay? But there are significant differences between the products that currently have A-codes and products that currently have Q-codes, okay? All of the A-coded products have processed collagen, okay? Basically, uh, whether it's synthetic or biosynthetic, the, the tissue is cooked, the liquid filtered, incorporating into a dressing with processed collagen and gelatin and other components, okay? The Q-coated products, however, okay, they contain protein. And some proteins are collagen. They're naturally occurring collagen. However, none of the Q-coated products contain processed collagen, okay? Basically, Q-coated products, especially the animal-based, are harvested intact tissue. For me, as an attorney, this was easy. This analogy, as crude as it may be, was what helped me, all right? You have... A codes and Q coded products. You have breaded processed fish sticks. You have sushi. <laughs> you have meatballs. You have steak. You have chicken nuggets. You have grilled chicken. Okay? That's what we see under the products that the work group has uh, coded so far. And the Q coded products, because it's intact tissue, acellular intact tissue, the processing is significantly and dramatically different. Very delicate, very sophisticated. This tissue is subject to oxidation, uh, very strict temperature controls, okay? More expensive process. So, what is alphaplex with marriage in omega-3? Okay, it is acellular intact fish dermal matrix. Fish off the coast of Iceland are descaled and decellularized, somewhat like mammalian tissue, however, some differences. It contains omega-3, okay? And omega-3 uh, benefits the healing process of the wound, especially assisting the Golgi apparatus of the, of the keratin sites. And this matrix 
is inserted into the wound, onto the wound, absorbed, incorporated, vascularized into your skin. Okay? It's, and your human tissue, your human skin, is stimulated by this, and it regenerates your own skin and ultimately replaces the matrix. Okay? Um, it's FDA cleared, available and marketed outside the U.S., Europe, Asia, uh, 25 clinical and preclinical trials to date, one of them comparing with um, uh, Ogenis, oh, I'm sorry, one of them complaining with um, the existing products under the Q codes. Again, 100% animal tissue-based non-viable cells. And Oasis is also, along with other products, 100% or rather are animal tissue-based non-viable cells, and they currently have Q codes. Okay? Now, the work group has currently assigned A codes for this product, dressing. But let's compare and contrast. Picking from one of the DMAC coverage policies, or coverage articles rather, this is the definition of a dressing. Okay? Protective covering applied to the wound for, uh, fun for, for securing. Uh, the, the primary dressing to the wound, okay? This is not the same definition as intact t tissue, all right? We also, if you also look at the PDAX database for products that are listed under the A codes, okay, albeit a voluntary process, but if you look at the products currently listed under the A codes that the work group uh, has preliminary uh, uh, preliminarily uh, de decided uh, where Alphaplex uh, with marriage and Omega-3 belongs, none of the products currently in, under the A codes are remotely close. They're dressings. This is matrix. Okay? It's not a covering. It's not a dressing. And in fact, the use of Alphaplex requires an A-coded product, a dressing, okay? for, for protection of the wound, uh, for maintaining moisture, for securing the matrix into the wound. And our secondary speaker will go more clinical into this process, but you'll see that for a variety of wounds, first it's cleaned, and there has to be some blood in the wound. Right, because those cells incorporate and utilize the matrix. It is made out of fish, but if you um, if you don't know, uh, there is no disease that currently is transferred between fish to humans. Okay, plus fish, as I mentioned earlier, high in omega three, which which contributes, which uh, is beneficial uh, to the healing process. It is cut to size as necessary and applied to the wound. Very sterile, waterproof surface. And you can see the vascularization of the product into the, the wound by the human body. Then you put an A-coated dressing onto the matrix and change the dressing as necessary. Again, Alphaplex is not a dressing. It is intact dermal matrix. Thank you. Okay, we have one five-minute speaker, Fertram Serga Johnson. Thanks. Hi. So my name is Fertram Serga Johnson. I'm the CEO and uh, co-founder of Caresis. I'm very happy to be here in Baltimore. It's already summer here in Iceland. Summer hasn't arrived yet. Normally it does in early June, so in a couple of weeks. So uh, I'm a chemist and a bioengineer by training, and uh, uh, my degree is from the Technical University of Denmark. 
and I've been working on this project for the past five years. Um, Keresis was founded by myself and two medical doctors. Uh, one is Dr. Baldur Tumi Baldurson. He's a dermatologist and the current president of the Scandinavian Dermatology Association. And um, Dr. Hilmar Kjartansson, emergency medicine specialist. And they both practice in Reykjavik in Iceland. So what brought us together on this project was our interest to develop better remedies for chronic wound patients. We all used to work together in a company called Össur. Össur is a prosthetic company and most of the customers of Usher are people that have been amputated because of chronic wounds. And we identified the uh, fish skin as a potential uh, uh, source material uh, for um, matrixes, skin substitutes, and as an alternative to pig intestines or pig skin. And uh, fish skin offers multiple benefits um, as a source product for matrixes. It's, uh, it's easier to handle than many of the other products. It's thicker. We don't need uh, laminated multi-layer products. It's ethical. Um, there is less disease transmission risk. And actually, there are no diseases that transfer from fish to humans. But there are multiple diseases that can potentially transmit from mammals to mammals. The product contains omega-3. And uh, we, in preclinical trials, we have demonstrated a better cell ingrowth into our material than into the mammalian. Uh, products. Uh, this is because of the omega-3 uh, content. And then we have demonstrated efficacy in randomized uh, control studies. And uh, we are already uh, present here in the U.S. We have um, use of the products uh, primarily in Florida, where we are branching out um, uh, with the help of uh, the chairman of our uh, scientific advisory board, Dr. Kirstner. And um, uh, obviously, reimbursement is a key thing for uh, for uh, the use of this product uh, here in the US. And uh, we respectfully would request the committee to reconsider uh, the uh, A code decision. Uh, we have demonstrated that our product is identical to the other uh, matrices on the market. So, thank you. Vascularized, yeah. Okay. So, basically, the product is put into the wound and uh, the cells grow into the product, uh, the product becomes vascularized. We have um, uh, studies that demonstrate uh, branching uh, in the product, and, um, and uh, uh, we apply a dressing on top of the product. The dressing regulates the humidity level in the product, and you exchange the dressing every two to five days, or two to seven days, and you re never remove uh, the matrix. Yeah, so I think these are my points. There are some questions. One comment uh, regarding the, um, actually, this uh, is a correction of the, uh, to the uh, main speaker. Uh, he mentioned that all processed to collagen are having the A code that's wrong. Um, the Prime Matrix is one of the processed collagen um, uh, that, that has Q code, and also the Integra processed collagen that has Q code. And Helicol also is following the same path. That's why we have recommended Helicol for the uh, HICPIX committee to, to review for the Q code um, application. And one more thing is uh, you know, there are lots of disadvantages for the intact tissue. When they have all the, um, you know, if it, is, if it is a mammalian species, you have at least the, uh, the similarity of, uh, you know, between uh, molecules. But if you go to the, uh, the um, uh, fishes, you know, uh, naturally you may have even much more uh, immunogenic components, which you know, I don't know for sure what are they, but definitely there should be more immunogenic components in the uh, other species. Uh, so all those things, uh, I'm just you know, uh, curious for you to have that noted. Thank you. If I may answer this. So basically, um, uh, we have, we have uh, autoimmunity and homology uh, was a concern to us because fish is not as related to humans as, as mammalians or, or uh, pigs. Um, so we uh, executed a randomized control study with 80 patients and on the request of the FDA. And we demonstrated in the randomized control study that there are no autoimmunity concerns for the product. And uh, the FDA was very happy with those results. Thank you. Um, I have one question for, for yeah. Dr. Sigurdsson. Uh, I apologize for if I massacred your name. Thanks. I tried. Um, so 
while we don't rely on um, the FDA classification of products, we heard from your representative that um, this is not a collagen dressing, yet information supplied to the FDA by you says it is. So, I mean, we see these kind of contradictions all the time, just sort of sharing some frustration, I suppose. Yes. Well, um, the, the product is unclassified, as all the other products that we have been discussing here. But there is a um, product name class that FDA has implemented, which is called collagen dressing. And if you look into the FDA database, the 510K database, and if you look at Oasis or Matristem or any of uh, the products that we have discussed here, they, are all, uh, uh, they all have the name collagen uh, dressings. And the, but if you look at the, the original submissions, you know the PDF files on the website, you don't, you don't see this. You need to look at the, the, um, the database result from, from in the FDA 510K database. But uh, there is, of course, collagen in our product. Our product is intact fish skin where we have removed uh, the cells. Um, so it has proteins and lipids. Uh, some of the proteins are collagen, about 30 to 40 percent. The other protein components are, are laminin and, and other types of, of, of collagens or proteins. Yeah. Mm. Okay, yeah, thanks. Mm. Okay, we do acknowledge that it is 12.15, but we're gonna press forth because we don't have that many agenda items left. If you could just bear with us, we would thank you. The next item is agenda item number 13. It is attachments number 14.16, request to establish a new level two HCPCS code for Architect PX and 14.50, Architect FX. There is no primary speaker for that item. There are no five minute speakers for that item. Moving along, agenda item number 14, attachments number 14.40, Request to establish a new level two HCPCS code to identify an amniotic membrane allograph, trade name Affinity, and attachments number 14.41. Request to establish a new level two HCPCS code to identify a dehydrated human placental membrane allograph, trade name New Shield. Primary speaker is Howard Walthall. Thank you, Howard Walthall, President and CEO of New Tech Medical. Again, we just want to express our appreciation and agreement with the work group's preliminary recommendation, and I'll be happy to take questions. If there are no questions, I'll, I'll move it along. Thank you. There was no five minute speaker for that item. Our last and final agenda item is item number 15. It is attachment number 14.31 and it is a request to establish a new level two HCPCS code to identify collagen matrix, trade name Olagen. Our primary speaker is Ken Kurt Daniel. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Ken Kurt Daniel. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of AUNOSTRON Europe and AUNOSTRON United States. I am employed by the company. I receive a salary. I don't have options or equity in the company at all. Um, we feel that the Ologen collagen matrix differs from the existing collagen dressings, such as A6021 and A6022, as recommended in the preliminary decision. Ologen CEM is used exclusively for wound healing in eye surgery procedures, such as glaucoma filtering surgery, enabling a healthy and prominent filtering blab, which is paramount to the successful outcome. So first, one of the Ologen's unique medical benefits to the ophthalmic patient is the induction of a non-scarring wound healing process without the use of antifibrotic or anti-metabolite agents such as, for example, mitomycin C, and this will reduce the number of revisits to the surgeon and results in a rapid, successful, and lasting recovery for the patient's ocular surface. 
with a similar reduction in the intraocular pressure. So the procedure has the same efficacy but better safety in comparison when the anti metabolites are used. So we presented some uh, data this year at the World of Family Congress, which is held every two years in Tokyo. So the, we finished a two-year trial in the United States by Dr. Robert Rich of the New York Eye Infirmary. And the data will be published in a peer-reviewed scientific journal later this year. We also presented five-year data from Europe by Professor Cellino. And that data is already submitted to a peer-reviewed scientific journal for publication later this year. So to tell, give a little bit of background on the mechanism of action, the failure rate of penetrating glaucoma surgery is mainly because of subconjunctival fibrosis. So the ollogen modifies the filtering blep scarring and controls early transcleral filtration. So the mechanism may be that it induces regular ingrowth of fibroblasts, within the scaffold and protecting against scar formation. So enabling a healthy filtering blab that contributes to a successful outcome. Secondly, uh, sometimes the surgeons do use anti-metabolites in this type of procedure. And there you can do revision surgery. And this would be an additional surgical tool for the treatment of symptomatic ocular hypotony. So, the eye pressure in glaucoma is too high. You do the surgery, the eye pressure becomes too low. You have hypotony, you have a leaking blab because uh, anti-metabolites are used and the eyeball can collapse. And one of the things they can use in this revision surgery is the ollogen collagen matrix, which then has a different mechanism of action. It absorbs the aqueous humor and presses down the scleral flap and now in the, allowing the doctor to do a successful filtering surgery, revision surgery there. And the advantage of this approach is also the absence of any massive IOP peaks, enabling this intervention to be performed as an outpatient procedure. So once again, we kindly request the committee to reevaluate their preliminary decision and assign a unique HICPICS code, HICPICS Q code to the ollogen collagen matrix for use in uh, eye surgery indications. Thank you very much and I'm ready for some comments and questions. Well, enjoy all. It was an interesting day for me coming from Europe and listening to this. Have a nice lunch. Bye-bye. <laughs> all right, so on behalf of CNS and the HICPICS work group, we'd like to bestow our sincere thanks for you all coming out and providing your excellent and thought-provoking discussion and for taking time out of your busy schedules to appear here today with us and share your valuable input. This meeting is officially adjourned. Enjoy your day and we look forward to working with you in the future. <laughs>